Greetings, party people. We are back. K Voy, Dos Zekis. I'm here with Andrew of Master Signified Bodies LLC. I am Nick of Free Beer Tomorrow. That's my brand. The brand ultimate myself, object. the ultimate objet a free beer for anyone who figures out what the meaning of free beer tomorrow is in Lacano, Marxist, Hegelo, Deridian. No, we'll throw Deridian out. <laughs> Chiasian. <laughs> Chiasian. That's an adjective we want to get going. And, and just know if the, you get it right, we'll give you the beer tomorrow. The beer will be free tomorrow. <laughs> if you figure it out tomorrow, that is the day after today, <laughs> you will be receiving your free Michelob Ultra, one of them. <laughs> and an elephant. <laughs> and an <laughs> elephant. <laughs> so get ready to shovel. <laughs> <laughs> a whole lot of shit because they be shitting and they be <laughs> that's right we're back with seminar two it takes two to make a thing go right exactly. and i know you have missed us in our absence we've been working hard to bring you memes all types of yucks uh we've been working hard to, to post responding to uh, some good comments, a few asinine comments here and there, which we welcome, of course. The more asinine, the better. Uh, you know, we want people to reveal their asses to us, you know, their own foolishness. Um, no, that sounds, that sounds arrogant. It is us. We are the fools. We are the subjects, the subjects supposed to fool yeah. all around. And that's what we're doing with this content. And, you know, that is what, to quote Nietzsche, makes us so wise, is that we are completely uh, uh, lacking in wisdom. Exactly. Like the joyful wisdom, which is really just like anti, you know, enlightenment philosophy, pretty much the Deleuzean, Spinoza's joyful spirit. Anti-enlightenment in the sense, to quote Junichiro Tanizaki, in praise of shadows, we hope to occlude where you may be seeking illumination. You won't find it here. Andrew, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm definitely getting pumped up to get into the first, well, three if we can, but uh, psychology and metapsychology, which is the first section um in the introduction chapter let's see how far we get and for those of you who actually do watch these episodes all the way through i believe some of you sorry souls exist out there if you have any desire to help us clip up these episodes please not Come only on. that i don't we have a lot of shit we also have some very supportive analysts in the in the background and the socius that tune into our channel. So any clinical, um, you know, metapsychological concepts that you could uh, clarify, please drop those comments. Those are always helpful. Yes, yes. Like I said, I want to clip these up, but I am not going to try to make these episodes any shorter. Yeah. That we should, we, we can. can always think of these like as like, you know, a read along, right? So at least along. like if you're watching it, if you're watching this all the way through, like this is not to supplement and be like the reason why you don't have to read Lacan's. Oh, we already got Nick and Andrew. It's like, no, we're giving you, you know, that extra boost so that you could go and do your own, you know, do your own research. <laughs> but for the most part, we're demystifying everything. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to reading the seminars. Don't read the Accre, right? Anybody that you see is like on Theorygram and 
whatever like random YouTube channels that want to reference certain concepts of a con and all you see them is holding the decree, stay away. You will not find anything good. You only find cruelty and perversion in the decree. If you really want to understand Lacan, suffer like the rest of us and go through the seminars. Maybe not one by one. You could go out of order. I recommend one, two, and 11. And if you are into BDSM, I would say the next time you find yourself in a hotel room with a, a bondage queen, have her read you the essay on logical time or cybernetics, and then you will experience a pain more delicious than any you could possibly imagine. Yes, it's, it's like, you know, opening up the, to the Cenobites. That's what the decree pretty much is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to jump in. Again, I, I don't want to try to make these any shorter, but we are trying to clip these up in a way, not the entire episode. We are looking for highlights. It's just, there's so much content here and we just do it so well that it's, it's hard to, you know, home in on anything in particular. Yeah. So I think jumping into this, <clears throat> what's really, you know, on, on the table is the notion of the ego, not only in Freud, but also like, uh, contradicting it from the pre-analytic notion of the ego in philosophy, right? And we have like the Copernican revolution in Kant who shifts it around from, you know, this uh, battle of empiricism versus like, you know, continental empiricism versus the continental rationalism. Like, the locks the Humeans, the Bacons versus the Leibniz, the Cartesians, uh, Malebron, et cetera. Those who want to try to find some sort of universal truth in nature independent of you know, consciousness through empirical understanding, through observation, and aligning with the beginning of um, you know, the scientific method coined by Bacon. And then you have a more formal understanding through the rationalists, through certain modes of like uh, syllogisms and givens, um, a priori knowledge, as we should call it. And then with the immersion of radical skepticism in uh, Descartes to the uh, first point of knowledge, which is the cogito, the I think, therefore I am, which Kant would kind of play along with that. But then uh, his Copernican revolution is pretty much the fact it's like, instead of trying to really see the world as it is, it's really as it appears to us, right? You know, it's always this like, this distinction of the phenomenal world and the noumena, but mainly like what makes this Copernican revolution a revolution is the fact that um, it switches from knowledge about the world to the knowledge about the subject. What must the mind be for nature to exist? which of course Schelling and the German idealists would say, what would nature be for the mind to exist in, right? But for the Copernican revolution referenced in enlightenment philosophy, for Kant, it is what it, it must the mind of nature to exist for the mind. But for Freud, it is this decentering of the ego and pretty much showing that there is a part of subjectivity that is not autonomous free will or has a certain agency that philosophy during that time was giving it. It's the unconscious, at least. I know you had something to say about, uh, you know, your, at least you had some inquiries about the Copernic revolution of Freud. Uh, I don't know if you want to voice those. I don't know if I had so many inquiries so much as I would say that the implications of Freud's discovery in many ways um, traveled beyond what he was even able to countenance through the apparatus that he had created. Yeah. And we talk about this a lot is that uh, he was consistently 
self-revising. Yeah. And something that Lacan is going to point out is how Freud, near the end of his career, with the discovery of Death Drive in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which is one of the works that's going to be explored yeah. in the seminar, he affected a further decentering mm-hmm. of the <clears throat> ego. And what's incredible is that this was a kind of Copernican revolution on top of his initial Copernican revolution Mm -hmm. in the sense that I, you know, I think you put it this way. I know uh, Todd often puts it this way that man is not master in his own house. And then with the repetition compulsion, it's almost as if that house itself isn't even what we imagined it to be. Yeah. Here we have, uh, through Lacan, this effort at systematizing and clarifying Freud and his discovery, but also emphasizing what in it needs desperately to be differentiated from ego psychology. Now he's now that we have already established what it is about ego psychology that leads to shortcomings or distortions of Freud's original project, let's say. Now we can, I think, together attack it head on from more, from almost a a social standpoint, a philosophical standpoint. And this seems to be what Lacan is doing because his register has changed somewhat. Like you can feel the shift occurring in this initial chapter and it's it's interesting they brings the cogito into it because a lot of this rests on that and what's interesting is so much really orbits around this notion of the cogito and the general psychological notion of the ego as it existed for philosophers so we're going to talk about two very important philosophers here of course we're going to talk about socrates and Descartes and the sort of notion of the ego as it's sort of hazily prefigured in Socrates versus the notion of the ego that Descartes is going to introduce through his adventure in doubting systematically. Yeah. These, are, these are two of the themes that are really operative here. And in it, uh, I think what we're doing uh, in, in, in Lacan's uh, efforts at this stage, it's like what he is trying to um, fan apart are the differences between consciousness, the I, which I guess we could say is the subject, consciousness, I, ego and unconsciousness Mm -hmm. it's almost like we have four different elements here which no philosopher or thinker other than freud up until this point has been able to really square together definitely and i want to i want to point like like it's interesting that like how like Freud did a Copernican revolution for the original Copernican revolution, uh, not with Copernicus, but like within philosophy and talking about the the cogito for the ego. Because you see during this, like, you know, this of just ideas and thinking that there was also the reaction against like rationalism and the cogito and enlightenment in general with the romanticists, right? And the unconscious was talked about in a certain sense, just not in the way that Freud uh, discovered it. Because you get notions of the unconscious and certain romanticist thinkers and poets, but a philosopher uh, in particular who mentions something of the unconscious is Edward von Hartmann, who of course Freud definitely read. But 
Edward von Hartmann's notion of the unconscious is like more of like an affirmative creative impulse to like be one with nature in a sense. It's kind of crude to say like, I want us to be one with nature, but it's more of like this irrational thing. Um, and this is something that actually Jung will take up to part and, and go along with, which differs the unconscious from Jung and Freud besides of something like repression or sexual libido, but that there is this affirmative creative principle in man. And yet that didn't solve a, or that didn't create a Copernican revolution. Um, Freud's notion, as you, as you put it, that we are not the masters of our own house and even our notion of the house is kind of still mis, uh, a misrecognition. Um, and it's funny because they'll, they'll bring this up with, the, with knowledge being misrecognized on its own accord, like it can't account for itself. Same thing with language, right? Uh, the second thing to bring up is what you're saying about the two main philosophers that we'll bring up are Socrates and um, Descartes. What's interesting about Socrates though, about at least a notion of ego, is not that he had a theory of the ego or a theory of subjectivity, but the famous line like the, uh, what is it? The unexamined life is not worth living, right? But like, what is meant by that, right? What exactly are you examining? And then as far as like, when we get into the Platonic dialogues, the you know question concerning the existence of a soul and all the stuff, like when you get into Phaedo, does there exist an afterlife? And it's always the soul involved, the Republic, even desire and the chariot of the soul in Phaedrus, all these things are in some sense, this radical, at least during that time, uh, understanding of, of some sense of substance or sense of essence prior to the beginning of philosophy, when it was just observing nature, observing change, being and becoming with the two prime examples, Parmenides and Heraclitus. Right, that that notion of being and becoming is going to be central here, and I don't. He won't put it that way in in those terms necessarily. But can you rewind what you just said a little bit about the the ego? Yeah, so the main thing is like what I think uh, looking at it and what Lacan might be trying to get as the fact that it's like with Socrates or, you know, Plato is that, you know, there is a notion of like some certain sense of the I, we could just call it the soul, but it wasn't at least theorized in pre-Socratic philosophy, right? We have uh, with pre-Socratics, they were focused on like a more of like observing change and being, but like in, in the world, right? You know, finding the principle or the logos of the world, but it's Plato and Socrates that kind of want to talk about, you know, knowledge, right? They're, at least they're code, if we would call it a cogito or the soul, it's concerned with the good, it's concerned with virtue, it's concerned with its immortality. Yeah, two things there. One, it's like we have this gradual de-substantialization of the soul over time this is what i was talking to you about earlier this to me what descartes does is at least temporarily de-substantialize the res cogitans like for the sake of bringing the subject to the irreducible kernel of its own self-transparency, right? Of like encountering itself as pure consciousness. And to do that, we have to imagine that it could just be a brain and a vet, yeah. which is still sort of a substantialist image, but like it's, there's a, a temporary um, foregoing of any kind of notion of, of, of the, of anything having any kind of substantial reality until we can reinstate substance once we uh, get to the core of consciousness as that which is conscious of itself. And then the other thing is with Socrates, what we witness 
in the platonic dialogues, the fact that they are dialogues is really interesting because it's like we have a place and time and we have real historical personages interacting with each other. And we have moments of moments in time and ideas being unfolded and investigated under the light of a specific scenario, like almost in a specific kind of theatrical context. You could, people do act out um, platonic dialogues. And what's interesting, it's like the localization of these truths in the individual is what Socrates in this dialogue that we're looking at right now in the Mino, what he chooses to focus on and, and the slave boy that he calls over to uh, demonstrate his ideas or, or you know his, his theory of knowledge is a prime example of that in that it's like here we have not like uh, what you see with the pre-Socratics, which is exploring general concepts. What we have is the localization of knowledge in the individual. So the degree to which knowledge is and truth is manifest within the, the the subject and that's why Lacan says you know what we're witnessing here is a kind of psychoanalysis that's occurring but he wants to make some very fine points about how and and why and and how we should approach that psychoanalytically without you know sort of overstepping the, the bounds of history and, and philosophy and, and branches of, of knowledge oh yeah I, th- I definitely agree. And then, like, I think one thing to point out, what, what at least you're saying is, like, there's a, a psychoanalytic um, aspect going on. It's, like, we should uh, at least address to the viewers that to say there's a psychoanalytic theme going on or psychoanalytic discourse is not the same thing to reduce things down to a psychologism. Totally different. To reduce things down to the faculties of a, of a quote-unquote mind, right? Um, so it's more about the the structure of a discourse. And in this case, what would make this, or at least the Socratic dialogues, a sort of psychoanalytic discourse is that there is always a subject in question of a subject supposed to know. In a sense, like Socrates is like hystericizing the uh, supposed thinker, like the sophist, uh, Mino, of course, since we're gonna get into the Mino in this uh, seminar. But the list goes on, right? Socrates believes that he doesn't know anything. And so he hystericizes all these important people, uh, statesmen, sophists, et cetera. As they're the subject matter expert. And they give these concrete, confident answers, but they're not really aiming at like the essence of what the question is implying, like the truth. And so then he starts to put into more question. It's like now there's this analyst discourse, right? Even um, the fact that some of the dialogues end without, you know, an answer. It's just left like paradox kind of like with um, the Euthyphro, right? With the Euthyphro dilemma. You know, why does God, you know, say, it, does God say it's good? Uh, or say it's so, like it's piety. Is it pious because because God says so? Does God say so because it's pious, right? And no, no. But that's it's like then it leaves further room for more dialogue or for more inquiry. And I think like um, thinking about it, it's like in some senses, maybe if one were to study the Platonic dialogue and their form and the way that they move in the discourse, you could find ways in which there are certain aspects of quilting points and the way that the analysts will quilty, uh, have a quilting point and then end the session right there abruptly. And it's like the 
analysts and not even have an answer to the question. So they're left with like a, a sort of contradiction or paradox, but it allows them to ruminate on that outside of the session to come back, you know? Right. So it's in many ways, the form of the dialogue that has a, a, a homology with the analytic experience yes, in as much yes. as at least the earlier dialogues and at the point of aporia and the quilting point within the session is a kind of aporia. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah, the term aporia, right. It under Whereas for the, the later dialogues, we maybe cannot say so because we're dealing with like, you know, notions of, of metaphysics and, you know, cosmology, and all that stuff. Right. And what we're dealing with here also, I think, is the subject of science once again. Lacan is going to uh, bring up this idea centered on the figure of what he calls the dentist. And I think this is really interesting because it's sort of like, for him, for whatever reason, I'm sure people who have studied these dialogues more than we have or maybe know French and can understand uh, whatever other connotations are going over our heads right now that have to do with dentists. It's like the dentist is the parochial thinker, the uh, let's say like your, your, your typical self-satisfied lib who is into a kind of scientism and believes that in like a Sam Harris sense that um a nascent morality is disclosed within science itself. The development of science itself somehow will uh, generate into being a sort of moral code or a kind of morality that's self-evident. Now, morality isn't what's uh, at stake here. He's not really talking about morality or moralizing, but I feel like there are undercurrents of that or undertones of it, like in the way he's talking about this figure of the dentist, the, 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 the bourgeoisie par excellence, let's say, who believes that they understand their place in society and what knowledge is and how things are meant to be known and how science is that vehicle through which we can uh, learn about the world and the privileged vehicle for understanding who we are and what things are. And he wants to throw that into question because, but I think one of the reasons he's bringing up this, these dentists is not just to um, critique the, the dentist ideology as much as also uh, try to almost like address the figure of the typical analysis that might be encountered uh, by these analysts in the sense that it's like you are going to be analyzing people who have uh, this certain conception of themselves and these natural like this idea of like a natural propensity I think he puts it or inclination of of man and this is a notion that he is seeking to explode in a sense, both as a general framework, which he be, he wants to um, contrast uh, from psychoanalysis, but also the the figure of modern man, which can be in many ways reduced to a, a specific kind of stereotype more easily than might be assumed in an individualistic society. So I think he's doing both of those things simultaneously. It, the way you describe maybe you think of like in the sense of it's almost as if in the case of the analysis that thinks that there are these like natural inclinations when they go into the, um, for instance, the, the clinic um, and, and it could be due to overall the ideology uh, purveying at that time, but even you can see it now um, of like just 
but not even just scientism, but just the way that science as false consciousness operates as a discourse, as something that's outside of like political economy. But one thing I want to, it made me think of like the way that um, Michel Foucault thinks of like in the birth of the clinic, the, the gaze of the doctor and where like they already have a preconception of what man is. So when they have somebody come in, whether it's a physician, you know, a pediatrician, whatever, they are like, already have a conception of you as an abstract thing and they just dissect parts of you analytically or like conceptually to prove what's wrong with you by certain criterion. And I think with the dentist too, to kind of play on with this thing, because who knows what he means why he picked the dentist. He could be like us, like where we just want to pick apart some random person. It's like just Sam, why Sam Harris? Well, we just want to roast Sam Harris, right? We just want to roast Nam Chomsky. So yeah. Maybe he just wants to roast the dentist. But they got it out of the plane on with it. It's like the dentist not only like serves and it's like maybe like they're a top-notch dentist, so they have some bourgeois, like petty bourgeois PMC type thing. But they're like in this enclosed environment where they're not dealing with speculation. They're not dealing with testing data. They are more of just like receiving the data from the higher echelon of science. And they're just focused on operating on somebody's teeth. They just think, oh, there's so much black on the gums or whatever when I'm you know, giving them a cleaning. This could, this indicates that it is gingivitis, right? I'm not sure if that's actually what it is, but like, let's just play the thing. But they confuse indication with certain, right? They're so enclosed in their practice that they don't step away and question the presuppositions of what grounds the, the practice of dentistry. They're so focused on the appearance that they take it as reality and that they become, in a sense, that abstract eye. But they only know their practices by practicing. They don't question, again, the presuppositions and what grounds a science of dentistry and the formula of it, like causality, the question of concerning causality, et cetera. What is, how do you diagnose a disease like gingivitis, et cetera? That, yeah, that's really interesting because it's like indication as a kind of certainty. Now it's not the certainty. I mean, at the same time, these dentists don't view themselves as at all dog dogmatic. It's like an anti-dogmatism is that feather in their cap that in some sense like defines them as in their minds you know subjects of modernity as opposed to benighted medieval thinkers for yeah. example this open-mindedness this anti-dogmatism but what we're dealing with it's not necessarily dogma but it is as we're going to explore a little bit later kind of uh orthodoxa or uh, right thinking. And I think in French, it's called like uh, bon pensant. If anyone speaks French, yeah. maybe they can correct that or back me up. But good like thinking. Good, good thinking, yeah. good thinkers. Now, what Lacan is offering here is not, don't get too excited, is not ideology critique. <laughs> That's not his, he's not like critiquing this yeah. bourgeois figure from any kind of like Marxian point of view, because if we know he's like pretty much a moderate conservative, he's not interested in subverting general yeah. structures within society. But what he is interested in is opening up a new field of knowledge in the sense that one that would question what the very foundations of knowledge are in a reflexive way and that knowledge itself of course would be subverted so what does it mean to subvert the status of knowledge and its relation to to truth well he says that he praises socrates in mino for doing just that what is he doing already there is a decentering now this arete is which is um perfectibility of the human being um sort of you know we talk about ray and ghost striving for perfection yeah great great, great intro uh skit the this is a decentering to the extent that what he's revealing 
Well, he's revealing a few things. I mean, through the, 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 the slave child, he's revealing that knowledge has a kind of retroactivity to it, that there is a symbolic substance to our lives in which we are immersed and uh, of which we cannot view from the outside, but also that arete might be distinct from episteme. And now we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but that, well, it's a, it, there are a few things going on. That one, he talks about behaviorism in a bit and some of the shortcomings of be, behaviorism and that there is a kind of embedded arete, a embedded notion that everything strives towards its own perfection and is in a sense perfectibility uh, perfectible if you're to trace all of the movements of various organisms you would see that born out through the process and that's seeing things from a kind of metalinguistic outside standpoint right. but also it's that what, what socrates is doing here is psychoanalytic in that he is dis disturbing the foundations of knowledge in its relation to, to virtue. Arete is a kind of virtue. And uh, in Mino, M Mino is one, of, it seems like one of the most inconclusive dialogues in that it's like, who can teach virtue? Well, it, it, no, who, who knows? Who, who's really up to the task of teaching vir virtue? And I, is virtue itself a, an episteme? Is it a coherent body of knowledge? And one thing I want to add is like you can see like these sophists who believe that they can teach good virtue in today's light with like uh, specifically self-help gurus, but also with like, uh, you know, CBT, DBT simps that when you go into therapy, they believe that they have something that they can teach you. They're already transferring on to you, counter transferring on you, and they have that dentist mindset. And then also you know, they're so abstracted or just isolated in, in their privileged position in society. Maybe not all of them are privileged, but some of them are just like, you know, I practice mindfulness every day. I have all these self-help books and, you know, I live a decent life. I, I'm always like, you know, doing all these neat tricks and stuff like that to be aware and to, to live a healthy life. And so at the end of the day, they don't realize the more structural note that I'm not trying to get more into it again, like Marxist critique of political economy, but the overall way that the symbolic order, you know, structures us, how we're structured in discourse. Not only that, like, because of that, they just think like, oh, if you just like, you know, unplug your phone, or if you just uh, go out and touch grass, like that's the be all end all. Obviously the psychoanalysis, that critiques that, but on uh, aligning it with like this, right? They believe that there is this, okay, because CBT is all about behavior. DBT is all about behavior. Realigning your behavior, your thoughts and emotions, that there is this perfect way to teach that. And which also presupposes is that if there's a, a correct behavior, right? It aligns with in the way that society ought to be because there is a correct society. And so that puts into question both behaviorists and sociologists. So there's a presupposed teleological trajectory to all of these sciences. Most of all, the therapeutic sciences, psych psychology, psychiatry. Yeah. None have, I mean, the, you know, uh, and a lot of like, quote unquote, like hard science type scientists uh, are, very dubious about the claim of different kinds of therapies to the status of science but also it's like you know that their their critiques are correct but erroneously correct at times uh, they approach it from the wrong point of view but one thing they might suspect that is true is that there is this inherent teleology that already defines the human subject as someone whose moves are made 
towards a kind of perfectibility or common good or uh, self-benefit. And this is something that Freud throws into doubt uh, in, in the most astonishing way, in a way that, that it is so astonishing that he himself had a hard time digesting what it was he had upturned in, in the, the process of dealing with people at the, at their most, their most vulnerable and, and at their quote unquote weakest and um, how the, the perversion, and it is a perversion of Freud's system that comes around with, as Lacan puts it, uh, oftentimes our friends across the pond <laughs> in not just across the one pond, but the, I would say England and America within the Anglosphere, what's yeah. going on with ego psychology, with the strengthening of the ego, what we're always harping on about is it, it's a complete betrayal. Nothing could be farther from what Freud was getting at than this sort of ego psychology in the sense that it tries to reestablish the autonomy of the ego in, in such a way that uh, it's, well, first, like why he ties it back to Descartes and philosophy, it's like in such a way that the, uh, what he calls the general psychology of the Western tradition, uh, Western philosophy, uh, that kind of, that sense of the ego is reestablished. And it's like, he's like, yippee, we've got it back. We're once again, masters in our own house. And, and also it, it's this strong uh, countervailing attempt to almost, I would say, repress what Freud discovered, which is this yeah. anti-autonomy exactly of the ego. Yes, and that's can, why it's so fucked up. <laughs> yeah, and like you can see now, like with ego psychology, it's like somebody could be really depressed. You know, they lost. You know, they got divorced. Uh, they're not happy at their job, or maybe they got fired. It's like I don't know who I am anymore. Like, you know, if we reorient these emotions and you uh, take this workbook home, you start practicing these breathing exercises. You come to therapy and you talk more. No, treat me like your friend. You know. Yeah, I'm a therapist, but like you don't have to see me as a scary person. You know, <laughs> act like I'm one of your friends, right? And then you like realize it's like you know maybe you know you had a failed marriage and you know you got fired from your job, but that's not truly who you are because deep down, you know you're the person, and we're gonna unlock that together. That's part of like you know an alliance, to, like whatever. Yeah, whatever you may doubt right there, like about all these things in your past, just know that. Truly, there is somebody that thinks, you know, and that, that wants to be, you know, and, and because there's no unconscious in the Freudian, Lacanian sense, you're just not like, you're just unaware of it right now, or you just need to reorient your thoughts, you need to learn how to uh, understand your triggers and, and cope with healthy emotions, that's going to unlock your true self, right, but that's, that's exactly the opposite. This is exactly what like Freud is critiquing about decentering and realizing that we're not these autonomous things that we can't just say like, I'm positive, you know, I am this, like all these like affirmation bros and, and all this like toxic positivity, you know, you're not the center of your universe. Great. And what, well, I think it's Manoni that's going to point this out a little bit later. I wasn't quite sure what he was getting at at first, but it's sort of when he says, you know, this idea of, as Zizek always puts it, quoting the X-Files, that the truth is out there. It's well, not in you. And that is what interests Lacan about Mino is the fact that this revelation emerges from it this cannot can never not have been there this has existed from the beginning knowledge is of that character mm -hmm. it emerges as something that could not have never been there that's the strange paradox of it and that's what's fascinating about the this dialogue too when you think about it because it's like there, there's this what's seemingly a digression 
and it's pretty boring where Socrates goes through the mathematical um, formulae that they're working through bit piece by piece. And then there's this question of virtue. And it's like, well, what the hell do those two things have to do with each other? Mm -hmm. I think that's also, it's like, it's two pronged. And it's like the two sides of this dialogue are exactly what psychoanalysis is dealing with, not virtue in the Greek sense necessarily, but like, you know, it's sort of, what is this knowledge aiming at? And how does it, you know, how does it operate? And, um, you know, how, how does it create its own criteria and how can, maybe criteria is not the right word, but how does it, it's the, the, its own inherent symbolic framework, how is it to be defined? And this is why this uh, introduction is very meta too, because he asks about, he, he wants to understand how psychoanalytic concepts themselves are to be taken, what status Right. Does psychoanalysis uh, attain to ultimately in its meta psych psychological, um, it, it you know, doctrine uh, creation, like the creation of the doctrine? What what does that ultimately produce? That's one of the questions he's asking. So there's so much going on here all at once and i think he believes that it's all condensed in this one dialogue exactly and, and, it, and it brings back like from the seminar when the very first uh chapter where you like questioning like uh papers on technique that we can't reduce Freud's system to like just uh, a few principles or sets of, of presuppositions right because then it would it would create like this doctrine or like enclosed system, right? Like a, sort of a meta language, but psychoanalysis takes its own thing into account as we know, because the incompleteness of just language in general, but you pointed this out too, that the psychoanalysis is one of the few courses that takes its own self into an account, trying to stand outside, you know, of the periphery or anything like that. And it seems like, at least like in the way that my UDIX plays in a role is this like it, it is also trying to at least take maybe maybe it is maybe it's not but like at least how it aligns right here with according to Lacan's dialogue that Socrates is taking like reason into an account um, and the fact that with Mino, it seems like he's giving all these examples, but he's never really coming down to the core issue of what's at stake. Like he's like beating around the bush and trying to make examples as meta. Well, let's jump forward because we're going to talk a lot more about Mino soon, but let's talk about Mr. Descartes and the Cogito. Or is it Cogito? Cogito, I think. Cogito, yeah. Because it's uh, Latin, right? It's Latin. It's Latin, yeah. Um, I think this it, is page what six? We're on page eight. Yeah. Page six. Um everybody knows, I think. Therefore I am. Therefore I am. Cogito, yeah, and we come Cogito, a lot. Erico, some. And what's interesting about the cogito in relation to Freud and his discovery, this decentering, this uh, overturning of the tyranny of the ego in some ways, is the idea that what Descartes made manifest was something mm, theoretically liberatory. People often e uh, use Descartes to act as like the bookend for modern philosophy to distinguish his discovery from the general trend of 
scholastic philosophy, which mm, it, it's questionable whether that could even be considered philosophy because it all rests on the uh, dogma of the existence of God and like the yeah, substantial dogma. reality of God. And it's like with he, he it, in many ways, um, like, plows the field for uh an atheistic vision of the world like he descartes has to necessarily adopt an atheistic point of view in order to re-establish the existence of god right. as an experiment so in a strange way it's like he becomes a a, a denier of god that's true, and and it, the way that like they they were, like during this time like he was very much scorned, and it's like a lot of the times the church would be like, oh, you're one of those Cartesians, like you like uh, heretic, uh, atheist, and that's funny because that's how he was viewed, even though like he was a man of he was Catholic, and then he wrote about the existence of God using Anselm's argument, but there is that atheistic stance because you have to be skeptical about um, any other form of being or truth, even skeptical of the world and your knowledge of it. But the fact that you are, you know that you're skeptical, it's the fact it's like, because I'm doubting, I'm thinking, because I think, think that I know that I exist. That's the foundation. Right, and it's philosophy is systematic doubt in 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 many ways that that's where the spirit of descartes uh is is as animate as ever but it what what's interesting yeah what we're saying is like descartes is in many ways uh, very much like a orthodox thinker in terms of the conclusions he draws but the weapon that he introduced in a sense was one that he much like let's say Oppenheimer had was not ready to deal with the consequences yeah. of and uh he was like Descartes was like I am the destroyer of all worlds now <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> I I am I am become modern philosophy <laughs> I am the destroyer of all worlds <laughs> and now we have uh you know fucking Audis and uh you know on-demand movies yeah. and Pornhub, and it's all Des- <laughs> it's all Descartes' fault. Yeah, the only you man don't realize. <laughs> I'm only I'm only like a quarter joking. I think there's some truth to that. But <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> systematic doubt led to it all. It wasn't just you know, I mean, it's like him and Gutenberg, and some other people. I don't know, <laughs> but the idea is that like consciousness grasps itself as such as he puts it here becomes transparent to itself undeniably so descartes wants to put philosophy on its feet and have it stand up to mathematics be something that is analogous to mathematics in its irresistibility of truth it's like irresistibly right. true it cannot be denied in the same way two plus two exactly. cannot be denied by anyone who uh, carries out the equation but it's like um, and maybe that's up for debate but what uh lacan wants to not contest here but problematize is not the idea that consciousness is transparent to himself he doesn't see that as so uh, um, um, he, he doesn't see that as so consequential as this idea that in this f- the phrasing of it, I think therefore I am that I slips under the radar. That's what I got from this is that I should not be allowed to just pass by. He Descartes smuggles in this I. Yeah. I is not as self-evidently self-identical as it might seem in this statement i is a big 
fucking matzo ball here <laughs> hanging. What is this eye? Confusing the thinking for the eye and vice versa. So it's like, but what is the eye? And I even think like Kant put that into question too. Um, not like I, I only got like past like barely past the first two chapters of the uh uh is it transcendental aesthetic and then uh transcendental like logic, but I think for the most part like Kant talks about like the eye having like some type of synthetical judgment. I could be wrong. But like even questions like the Cartesian notion of the uh, I think therefore I am. But for the most part, I think they still have some similarity to them. Anybody who's Kant scholar, please drop that shit in the comments. Well, from what I understand about Kant, it's like we have the 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 I or the subject for Kant is not just a pure receptivity, exactly a, a transcendental apperception because it. The I must posit itself as one of the objects of which it is aware. Yes, but there's all the synthetical fact that it's like obviously it needs experience for that. So there's like at least the synthesis of a priori and a posteriori, right? Right, because that you're right, because that is what Kant is is grappling with that makes his his system so revolutionary. How can something be mm -hmm. a synthetic a priori? Yeah, How can it hold true in any possible universe, let's say, but also need to be discovered in a at least quasi empirical way? Exactly, because the main thing about the faculties of understanding, right, is that you can't understand an object or, or like have some notion or reasoning in it if it's outside of space and time. Space and time are the fundamental, I think, both space and time are a priori. Forms of intuition. Forms of, of intuition, exactly. Yeah. Sensibility. The necessary forms of intuition. What's fascinating about that, it makes me think of like the that that in itself has a, a certain psychoanalytic resonances in that there is no meta language there is no proposition that can be uh formulated that exists outside of space and time as exactly. a general structure and i think as far as like not even just like for anybody who's just interested in just psychoanalysis and, and lacanian theory like modern philosophy even now with like Jack, the Kenny theory, Alenka, all these motherfuckers is that the question, and even for the post-structuralists, is like this grappling between Hegel and Kant. And Kant, like, you know, our limits of knowledge because of that understanding of the formal understanding of space and time, right? You need those intuitions. You can't possibly think of anything outside of space and time, right? And not only that, but then we have Descartes smuggling because of his notion of the mind or, or, or subjectivity. You know, even Zizek comes up to that part in the typical subject, correct? Well, you know what? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he has a long um, passage about, like a, a whole chapter about uh, Descartes and the Cogito. But what, what you made me think of that's really interesting, though, with uh, this conflict between Team Hegel and Team Kant is that when it comes to analytic philosophy, who gets a pass when uh, of all the German idealists, it's like Kant is to a certain extent, like he's cool, he's, he's invited to that cookout yeah so, because it's like oh all right yeah he's a he's the end of the enlightenment but he's an enlightenment thinker he's cool right. like yeah. i i remember you know i read this book i forget what it was called it's like i think it's just called kant's analytic uh i forget the name of the author but like he was uh um cri critiquing kant's analytic from the standpoint of analytic philosophy and I don't remember a lot of the details, but it's it, but like they will engage with Kant seriously and take at least like his ethical 
philosophy seriously. It gets to be part of the dialogue. Whereas that like with Hegel, Hegel is Hegel's a bad boy. He- Hegel is inscrutable. Hegel is um just like he he's he's way too wild. He's yeah. he's way too uh flagrant with like the way he uses concepts supposedly and he can be dismissed a lot more easily because he just, he's considered the um, perversion of Kant, whereas like people respect Kant for like supposedly adhering to the limits that he introduces to his own system. But <laughs> no, but like, yeah, Hegel would say, Kant, you're not Kantian enough. Exactly. Like, and that's what the whole project German idealism was with uh, after Kant, uh, because the real German idealists were, um, you know, Hegel, Schelling, and Fichte, right? And in some sense, Goethe as well. Holderlin, Holderlin was more of a poet. Uh, but to the extent they were like grappling with Kant's system of transcendental idealism. And pretty much, yeah, they're all like, you know, you're not Kantian enough. The only one that was really trying to like, you know, give ground uh, to Kant, you could say give ground relative to his desire was Schopenhauer, because Schopenhauer was definitely simping over Kant. <laughs> I oh, think the, yeah. only thing, the only thing different that he does is that he says that no Kant, um, you know, faculty of, of understanding of causality is not rooted in the mind, that we know it in the phenomenal. So he wants to give causality it's due by putting it back into the phenomenal world rather than in the, you know, understanding the faculties of the mind. Right. Kant wants to, I mean, because the synthetic a priori is the question of causality. Yeah. In that, like, how can we know that something is to occur according to, let's say, certain Newtonian laws, and yet the horizon of its disclosure is time bound and mm-hmm. must only be like revealed through time because it seems like well not in the hegelian sense of absolute knowing but like should shouldn't there be an attainable episteme of like a coherent body of knowledge a theory of everything that would let us know in the most simple terms like what's going to happen all the time mm-hmm. and it's like well let's uh, to bring it back to Lacan here it's like what does all this have to do with anything it's like well there's so many directions we could take this but as he puts it here it's like a, so they, they're like Kant along with Descartes whether they want to be or not are profoundly anti-religious thinkers in many ways and they want to as I said before like desubstantialize this concept of the soul or like hold it, it hold in abeyance certain received notions before they can create a, a new groundwork that would better root those notions it's kind of like i don't know it you're working at a job like and let, let's say you like have a, a management position you're like all right let, well let's um let's let's change the general um structure of things let's introduce a different hierarchy to make things like uh run more smoothly and it's almost like that's what they're trying to do and that like but to do that we have to there's going to be a um, trial period where it's like all right and we have to take all the old concepts set them aside for now but don't worry like you're not going to lose any of your, your your precious uh, you, the roles that you're attached to. All right, my this yeah. analogy is really fraying, but like hopefully, no, you, like you, I, you know, I, it's, it's like you, you, we're gonna re, we're gonna if things are gonna be back the way they were, but they're gonna run better. I think overall there is this like you know hierarchy of like you know maybe like reason, but in the sense it's like with even Kant's like. Uh, apperception of an eye right it's this is always like this eye that still needs to be put into question like the eye is still this unified it, it's ultimately a unified thing and that's what is 
totally the opposite of psychoanalysis because all of Lacan's career is talking about, again, Zizek's career is talking about, even with post Hegelian, like bringing back Hegel in the Ljubljana school and then with Hob Allen, contradiction and split subjectivity, which is totally different from a unified eye. And this is what gets put into question because he says right here on this page that he's like, uh, the eye is an other. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. That's how he ends this part here, which I love. I is an other. This is the discovery of Freud's that has such profound yeah. and threatening implications is this idea that the I is an other. And this is the fascinating thing, and this is something that Zizek has said in the past, which is that what is the point of studying psychoanalysis if you're a philosopher, you have no interest, especially in trying to, uh, you have no, let's say you have an interest in philosophy, but no interest in people's symptoms or yeah. how, how to improve or address uh, states of, of uh, emotional states or whatever. What th is important in studying psychoanalysis as a philosopher is that Psychoanalysis addresses a dimension that philosophy forecloses. And I think the, the discovery of the unconscious is something that philosophy on its own, with its own tools, could never have produced. It's only through even a thinker as unique as Heidegger, who's approaching things from the point of view of like, let's ground our philosophical yeah. concepts in phenomena mm -hmm. could never create, could never, not create, but like could, could never contour anything like the unconscious because it's, it's not through a specific system that something like that can be produced, but only through a, an engagement with the contingencies of speech itself that yeah. the unconscious can be made to emerge. And what's one thing is interesting is that, you know, with the uh, sign, right, being in the world, right, it's a part of the world, but it, it is not the world, make, at least I think. But there is also being with others, but it's like not that being is an other. You get this with Hegel, and the fact is that self-consciousness, once it pauses itself, then comes into the encounter with an other. And that is what's important about this mythic understanding of the connecting hair or lordman and bondsman, lordship and bondsman, because this is the battle of intersubjectivity and the positing of one's reflexivity. It can only happen through this notion of recognition. But we know that recognition is a failure. But the main thing is that there's this, that's the dialectic and split of subjectivity that like it has to go out but with outside of itself it's not just exteriority as far as like and and, and Artra does this too right because the subjectivity is nothingness in the nothingness it annihilates that it becomes exteriorized into the world and then we understand the problem of the other and the other brings a problem to us because we are absorbed by the other but we also retreat back to try to formulate ourselves and I think that's something that you could probably pause and see here when you think about the I as an other. And the critique that Hegel brings about, about self-consciousness, the unhappy consciousness, is that with stoicism, it tries to withdraw from the world and posit itself as something that it can control, but really it's still relies on the world. And it can do so in position of being objected to the world. And this is something that like Isaiah was like helping me with, like understand like the unhappy consciousness freedom and stoic you know sense of self control or self consciousness we got to get him on here yeah. especially at this juncture i feel like Drake but does, does that like make some kind of point out? Makes, especially i think with it helps sartre a lot yeah I mean, there's a lot there i don't know that i can like uh faithfully uh, address every point you made I think that this notion of the I as an other 
it's just it's alien like, other than what it means. <laughs> what okay, aliens a good word. It's like what's alien about otherness? Yeah. Is like if, if philosophy is that which would attempt to like colonize or domesticate a sort of otherness that um lies beyond what the other sciences are able to apprehend or in themselves it's like if philosophy is the queen of the sciences then supposedly it would address what's foreclosed by the other sciences but this is what i was trying to get at before it's like what does philosophy foreclose and this and that is what psychoanalysis addresses now i don't know andrew if that like speak oh, yeah. anything you're talking about right and, now and, but and and i think like other is not just like the fact of like the other person the uh, the other self-consciousness but if the unconscious is the other it's also the other's discourse right we got to think about like function and feel and also what Derek hook told us is like the we should think of like the bringing about of the signifier which which tries to create a, a referential system of the discourse of the other and and that's ultimately what the i is and we should note that the i might be different from the ego right because the i also has to do with the subject correct absolutely remember this seminar is called the ego in freud's theory and in the technique of psychoanalysis so what's lacan trying to do he's trying to locate the ego define yeah. what it is in order to do that he has to disambiguate it exactly. from consciousness and the eye and what the eye is and i i read you know i i read a little bit ahead and uh you know later he's going to say don't think because there is this disagreement between i and me the i and me in that statement that the i is simply the inverse of me I, that only recuperates me as an object the yeah, i is something else yeah. um, but don't let that impress you don't start spreading around that the i is another <laughs> it won't impress don't anyone. use this term as a mouthwash i love that <laughs> that little metaphor here because he says yeah, yeah. this is his version of don't get too excited again yeah. it's like you the think dentists use this though they're using that as a mouthwash oh shit, I didn't even, <laughs> yeah i didn't even put that together yeah he's like <laughs> See, once you start that, because it's like once you start simply regurgitating these <laughs> these like slick phrases as doxa, yeah. as orthodoxa, what happens? You become just another dentist. Exactly. You're gonna be like, what's his name off of a uh, Hangover? I'm a doctor too. No, you're not. You're a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Dentists do get a bad. I feel like dentists do get shit off for whatever reason. Yeah. Society. Yeah. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. So so he says, don't start, don't let this impress you. Another classic, <laughs> classic Lacan here. Don't let this impress you. Don't start spreading around that I is another. You don't know what that means yet. Slow your roll. Stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> not there yet like the fuck are we talking about we're talking about the unconscious yeah the unconscious completely eludes that circle of certainties by which man recognizes himself as an ego so what's interesting about this is that the ego is completely dependent on the unconscious to be the ego it is riddled with these these gaps with these holes I, as I, I put it in one of the audios, it's perforated in a sense by the unconscious. The thing is, we imagine this ego as this thing that's held together, but it, it's to me, it's only held together from a distance, like just like something sometimes, and this is a metaphor that Zizek's used before, sometimes like things that are blurry and in the distance that you're far from actually have more of an objectal presence than when you get close to them so right. i think the ego is like that it's only more of like a held together object the farther you are from it exactly and this you is get the, the more it's like shot through with the unconscious right and this is the whole point of the optical schema and the lure 
But not only that, the main thing that makes the ego what it is, is not a knowledge, not connaissance, but meconaissance, misrecognition. And it misrecognizes itself from a certain angle, a certain position that it's in. And what it is, is just a, this amalgamation of idealizations of, of fantasies um, and resistances, et cetera. In so far that it moves to get closer to the ego, it, it, it resists because the whole point about like at least seminar two is that now we're introducing more of the function of the symbolic. So there is this symbolization to the ego, but there's also the point where res resistance represents that which resists civilization, right? Which will be the uh, reason, right? But there yeah, right. And the other thing is we've been talking about this recently. Lacan does not have a good notion of the real yet. No, so, no, no, no. In in a strange way, I feel like resistance stands in. There are a few different uh, characters, let's say, that stand in for the real at this point, and I think like resistance is one of them. Yeah. In a strange I way, because it's like, like you, you see what I'm saying. Oh so, yeah, and I think that uh, that that's the key. And then like reading, I was reading um, the Power of Horror from uh, Kristeva, and it seems like abject. So might be in a sense that which is also the real that excess because it is trying to align with the ego the identity and the i but it, it jettisons it out right and that seems to be also very much aligned to the resistances of the ego yeah it, well with the abject it's sort of like and this is i think what lacan is struggling with right now is sort of he knows there is, he says in seminar one, uh, the, he does define the real as that which resists symbolization, absolutely. But I don't think he has, a, at this point, um, been able to sort of like cogitate the real as the deadlock within the symbolic. It's like for him, I think the symbolic symbolic efficiency is is very is operative and 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 does the job. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas later, the deadlock in the symbolic, the antagonism within the symbolic, is going to be the 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 thing that makes the symbolic what it is on the one hand, but also is the stumbling block of the symbolic simultaneously. So th th this is one of this is a conflict that I think he's dealing with so i i don't know that we can even fully appreciate his notion of the unconscious at this juncture because he doesn't have the best idea of the real like i feel like uh, for him the unconscious at this point is still very much it is uh you correct me if i'm wrong but like a fairly coherent discourse yeah like he he's still elaborating on it on it like so because like all we have is just like signifier or well, you know seminar three we get more understanding of like the signifiers the master signifier right because we have to deal with foreclosure and the difference between a neurotic and a psychotic but like right here right where we're getting here just like we'll, we'll, we'll get like into like the the notion of the e e this entire seminar and understanding of like censorship but like I think for the most part we don't get like this coherent understanding of like what exactly constitutes the un unconscious besides just like the symbol, right? Or, or like, like the seminar one, it was like the symbol, right? The signifier. Or in function and field, it was like the discourse of the other. We don't know like exactly the discourse. We get hints of that because like we get like the compulsion to repeat seminar one, sadomasochism. Um, we get like this notion of like something like libido, you know, without the ego and this contradistinction between libido drives and ego drives. And then we have also something about the notion of like the imprint and the return of the repress, right? When we talk about Wolfman and the, the problem or however you pronounce it, th this notion of like one's like, da sign but the da sign is not like in the way that Heidegger would use it but like it seems like he wants to locate da sign as like what is kind of forgotten 
right? The forgetting of the forgetting, which is the unconscious or the repression, but that's what constitutes the unconscious, that which was repressed. But tying it in, it's never really true repression because there's always a return of that because it's never perfectly repressed. Repression is always a failure. Yes, yes. Uh, and I read today in Surplus Enjoyment, he was quoting Adrian Johnston. He said, you know, it's like, we know repression is always the return of the repressed, but uh, what does he say? Something like, but, um, God, I, I don't have it right, but how the, it shows how repression is a failure to repress, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most that. Definitely. The return is the result of the of of repression's yeah. failure, essentially. Uh, so we have this equation of ego and consciousness. He says that Freud is having a hard time locating consciousness, mm-hmm. and he has to admit that it is ultimately un localizable everything is progressively more organized within a dialectic in which the i becomes distinct from the ego so ego is not consciousness no no and he yeah he he probably like avoids using consciousness altogether but an ego at least like in the way that like the, the clinic like one tries to identify themselves with but it's obviously decentered or it, it's not autonomous because of the unfulfilled wish because of the unconscious and this is where um, he starts to talk about like uh, behaviorism. Yeah. For example, we, we already touched on this before, but uh, there are uh, these finely plowed sort of uh, pathways uh, that behaviorism imagines to define the, uh, you know, actions and evolution of the organism towards a perfection or arete of the species but upon what axis would that even be possible it's not so much what are these goals is is man a goal bound creature or but like what would even what would be the axis of that from where would those pathways even stem that's what i got from this yeah Um, no i think yeah i think that that's that's correct i don't really have anything to add on that one but the subject on the other hand like let even like let's provided all of that were true the subject is still eccentric. The subject still exists mm-hmm. outside of whatever the organism does to adapt itself. Now, the, because the subject is in its linguistic form necessary for grammar to be able to follow its own laws in a sense you know it's interesting because it's like uh, something Zizek once said is the I stands for the speech act as such what sets the speech act in relief from everything else um, and this is something he's going to say I think it's here that the creative act the creative dimension of speech is what again is foreclosed by yeah. science so behaviorism has no room for speech and it definitely has no room for speech yeah as a creative act exactly because it's like well what is behavior then was it the fact that like i move a certain way or is it customs but also not to just like bulldoze that point but just like to bring it back to mino in mino when he's writing out uh, the mathematical equation in the dirt there, what's happening in Myutics, what Plato might think of as 
mere recollection, Lacan would understand as the creative act of speech, which, you know, creates a sort of eternal truth in, but in time, in the moment and creates the conditions of that thing being true at the same time that it needs it's referred back to those conditions in the very moment of its elaboration how could this never have been this is something that behaviorism can't touch essentially the i is the same because the i is also the subject the quilting point we always think of as okay let's say in linguistics the quilting points the period at mm-hmm. the end of the sentence but yeah. the quilting point is not just the end of the sentence it's the quilting point as it is um reflexive upon the eye right as right, it changes right. the eye so it goes back to the eye that is this retroactivity that's All exactly knowledge has a retroactivity to it that's what Hegel brings up too in in um the beginning of the phenomenology with the, the subject and the predicate and that predicate the stick also depends on the predicate and vice versa. So there is this re- retroactivity in that, in, in a statement. And I think what he was trying to get is like the uh, understanding like a statement of absolute truth and like what is God, moral world order, God is, right? God is then predicated and predication must also go back to define what, you know, absolute substance is. Mm, right, well, that's interesting because then God is phallic in that sense. And it's like the abs- absolute predication. There yeah. must be this terminal point upon which all things are predicated. That mm-hmm. would be God yeah. in that phallic dimension. But all right, we're, fi- we're almost through this, but- uh, He brings he, up La Rochefoucauld. La Rochefoucauld. Somebody who is very influential to Nietzsche in his aphoristic style of writing kind of like one of those like forgotten figures. He brings up this understanding of like self-love and like self-interest, like based upon like our passions and stuff like that. Is everything done out of pathological motivation? Yeah. The question, pathological in the Kantian sense of the hypothetical imperative for a specific aim in order to obtain specific object of one's interests rather than as a pure maxim Mm -hmm. for itself um and socrates would say no right to to have knowledge is to be good to put it plainly no one knowingly does evil exactly right no one knowingly does evil very controversial. Mm-hmm. Um, Zizek, I, I was reading, talks about this today in reference to Schelling, who says, well, to solve it, it's like as if a choice were made. And this is as if a choice were made a temporally between good and evil. It's not a real act, but much like the unconscious, what happens in the unconscious must be assumed responsibility for the choice of doing evil in itself, even though, even if it didn't happen in actual time, even if there is no temporal point at which one could like locate the choice of evil should be assumed as a choice in a strange way. It's a paradox of, of, yeah. of free will. And I think it kind of plays into this. That's interesting. Does he say that in the plus enjoyment? He says that in surplus enjoyment, but uh, that goes all the way back to uh, Sublime Object. He talks about yeah. this, the idea of like, okay, uh, so you think of someone who's uh, evil, a Ted Bundy, for example. I made that meme yeah. today with Ted Bundy. Yeah. You know, it's like on the one hand, you know, basic like Chomsky Sims will be like, well, nature versus nurture, but that doesn't really get at the core of what evil is and that like, evil in this case it's like we if you probably i haven't read any like you know biography of ted bundy or like a you know, sort of examination of uh his life and his crimes and murders it's like but 
the language of it in these documentaries and everything always switches back and forth between nature and nurture in the sense yeah. of, oh, he is just like that. Um, and there's almost a kind of pity and sympathy that they tried to rouse at different points for him. And then at other points, it's like, no, he's, he's evil, as if it was a choice that he made. So we always shift back and forth between these two philosophical positions implicitly. Exactly. And that our whole society is, is based on that. Yeah, especially with, when it comes to law and, and uh, legal, it's based upon uh, an autonomous subject that makes choices, right? sometimes yes sometimes no that's a fascinating yeah. thing it's like at the core we should be theoretically that but then it it, it becomes yeah doubt, doubtful in the it, investigation of like the the specific right cases right in the universal sense yes we are these autonomous subjects that make our own choices when it looks at the specific cases suddenly that becomes problematic Right, because then there's like murder, pre, there's premeditated murder, right? You didn't like plan on doing it. You didn't have like a, a goal or like, you know, you weren't trying to get some incentive out of it. Like it just happened. You like got an altercation, you fought someone and like adrenaline took over and you broke their neck or something like that. Right? That wasn't premeditated. It could have probably get charged with like manslaughter. But like, you know, then it was just like, is it like there's this nature aspect? Or is it like the, the whole conversation, like you're saying, it's always circulating around nature versus nurture. Like, well, does he have some aggressive impulse in him just by nature? Because, you know, he lost control and he busted his neck. Did he learn it? Like, you know. But it's also like, yeah, in terms of why did he do it? But also the, the final word mm -hmm. is inconclusive in that, like, do we condemn this person as evil? Like it's it's hard to completely abstract from the idea that evil is a choice. Mm -hmm. In this sense, it's like evil, and and that's what Schelling ingeniously is able to address this idea of like a a choice that's not really a choice, but yeah. still should have the the character of a choice. And how this relates to the unconscious is that the unconscious is also, let's say, like a a slip. Freudian slip, for example, is has the quality of a choice, but it isn't really a choice. Mm -hmm. But if I, if you say something sexual where it should have been something normal right. every day, I still kind of like see it as something you chose you right. didn't choose to say it in that moment like you didn't choose to say it in that moment but it's something you want and therefore in terms of the autonomy of the individual you, you chose it but at a different level exactly and, and then what we like as far as in the freudian model of the unconscious is like the down is the of the core is the um repressed unfulfilled wish but it's like well, what was that wish why is it that you wished that right is there a choice on wishing for that specific something. Totally different from Lacan with desire, right? But needless to say, we're still grappling through this Freudian model. We haven't really gotten to like Lacan's graphs of desire and all this. Desire was mentioned in the last seminar, but like not as articulated as you would get into like seminar full, like no, seminars five and you know, six, and then so on and so on. Right. And I don't think, and, and Lacan at this point isn't talking about desire all that much. No, no. Um, everything in this third part, I think we pretty much covered. Yeah. So as usual, it took a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> I think than we expected to get through this. Yeah, yeah. I see he brings up uh, Hartman, right? Hartman, yeah, yeah. This is what we talked about before. Ah, our nice little ego is back again. It all makes sense now. Um, I don't want to gloss over this unless you have something to say about this last part, but no, because like you know, it would just be going on into the next one. You know, we get more articulated into like the next uh, chapter. All right, um, take a break. Yeah. Um, all right, we're back. So, I think we're only so going to cover this chapter, Andrew. Like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm with it. So right here, right, like this is where we get to what you were talking about, about orthodoxy and, and orthodoxy. Yeah. At least not orthodoxy and religion, but like, you know, the right understanding, the right belief, right? Because, I mean, according to Plato, right, everything is ultimately an opinion in the world of becoming in the simulacrum, right? Knowledge is escaping the cave or truth. Um, but right here, at least in this sec second chapter, knowledge, truth, and opinion, this is where we really get to what we're talking about in the last one. We were kind of spitballing about the Mino. This is where the Mino really takes um, precedence because um, it was uh, one of the French philosophers, Alexandre Corbe, who gave a lecture the night before this uh, lecture took place on the Mino. So it really comes into dialogue for this entire chapter and dialogue for Lacan and Menino and Hippolyte, the homie Hippolyte. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I mean, I don't think there's really anything on chat or page 13, but I mean, right here, he says something on page of the beginning of uh, page 14 about um, discourse. Um, but when it comes to like, like what he says right here, you could see what this coherent discourse led him to uphold analytic concepts have no value, whatever they do not, they don't correspond to reality. But this reality, how are we to grasp it? I think that's pretty interesting because it's like, when it comes to the analytic discourse and like what we talked about in seminar one, right? Uh, the recollecting of the subject's past and, and historicizing it in the present, right? An interpretation doesn't necessarily correspond to the reality, but neither does like the compulsion to repeat or somebody's dreams, right? It isn't correspondent to an exact event or object in reality or space and time. But what it is is something that holds at least weight for the subject, right? And symbolizing, and then even on the imaginary level, having affective uh, reaction, for lack of a better term. And I think that is something that is unique with the analytic discourse in the working through. Now, is that because of the signifiers present in the discourse, or do you think it has something to do with syntax itself? I think that's interesting to say, yeah, maybe it's the signifiers. I'm not sure about the syntax, but I think the signifiers do try to grab a hold of something that it could at least make a coherency to, but it, it definitely isn't like, in a sense, uh, like a reality as it is or in and of itself around the world but it's mainly when we talk about the world or object psychoanalysis it's never like in the philosophical sense it's more of like rep we're dealing with representation in a sense but this representation has a more clinical structure to it for instance when we talk about objects like transitional objects in, in object relations or fetishes, these aren't actual objects. These are replaceable objects that take the for something that is lacking. Do you think when you say representation and if we're to take into account what Lacan said at the end of seminar one, then the things represented are not our focal points here we do not need to salvage things yeah. from the discourse of the other that we're listening for we need to focus on the signifiers in their purely representational state yes and i think that's why he had criticisms of a sort of intellectualism or intellectualist tradition in psychoanalysis with like the anarchon like school of thought because they were probably trying to do that salvage objects 
right. possibly right. even in the you know object relation school of thought which would assume in some sense that there are fixed objects in reality and as philosophical as the last chapter was lacan is not trying to present an ontology here that's important to note uh but he is in some ways trying to define the reality addressed by psychoanalysis and i think here he's talking about analytical concepts themselves you know this is an example to me of how we get to the impossibility of meta language and that you know the meta psychology technique what's the name of this seminar freud's theory and in the technique of psychoanalysis so he Yes. distinction between the two we have theory and technique mm -hmm. here we have almost like a kind of parallax in a strange way and the fact that he talks about analytical concepts what's the point of expatiating on the meaning of these concepts that's a question he raises well the point almost is to direct our attention to this parallax what happens in the session is going to seem to be a domain completely apart from all of the principles being expounded upon and yet these principles are important yeah but they aren't as directly applicable as maybe certain other scientific principles in other fields of study once you're face to face with the patient however much you might try to categorize and classify the phenomena that you're experiencing in the moment it's not going to seem relevant if you're really doing your job right yeah like oh this is oh he's obviously um talking about the anal stage here and like <laughs> this is this is a very anal discourse it, you know yeah and right there, you get into your dentistry. <laughs> Beautiful. Exactly. That's dentistry. Yeah. We're not trying to do that. And the point is, like, you know, again, <laughs> don't get too excited. Don't Wait. go around spitballing our using Del these as mouth. Are Deleuze and Guattari dentists because they're always going on about the molar? I don't know. I've never <laughs> really heard That's like in ask cody yeah like the practice of guatari for the most part i think he was just doing psychoanalysis i feel like he was just doing lacanian psychoanalysis but his meta psychology was aligned towards a politic you know uh understanding capitalism in relation to no but i was just kind of joking because of the molar yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Um, anyway, so he, he, what are these psychoanalytic concepts for? I think is is what he's asking here. Yeah. What use can be made of them? Yeah. And, and, and I think it is what relevance do they have? Yeah. I think it is interesting that you brought that up using like that example, like the anal stage, or because like he he really does not chive with, with that stuff you know, because it has a sort of developmental connotation. And we already know that he is anti-developmental. He's a structural thinker. And even like, for instance, the mirror stage, we should, it gets skewed like saying that it's a developmental thing. Like, you know, the, the baby develops an ego from the mirror stage when he looks in the mirror, like the, the typical, you know, theory influencer describes it as such. But no, it's actually like something that is just forever going on in somebody's life. The fact is that everything acts as mirrors, right? But the, the babies are known in the language. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, we're already already throwing in language. And when you look at the logical time thing, it's like there is a mirroring based upon gestures, not as like a baby looking in the mirror. Like, 
to the whole myth of uh, or analogy of like the, the prisoners with the, the markers on them represents in the way that intersubjectivity mirrors each other or people mirror off of the other from the other's failed conclusion that I must be this. Um, but one thing is just the fact that with these things, like, again, these concepts in psychoanalysis, in the practical setting, it seems like what it does is it creates a lot of countertransference and it doesn't really get into the station of understanding the patient of the Freudian experience of like, not only never speaking too soon or too late, but always just listening and like rethinking. Because Freud, like he was never a common conception is that Freud had a closed system, but he didn't. He was always investigating, right? He was always reworking through because he was the first psychoanalytic theorist. But I think the also contradiction was the fact that he was also trying to be a scientist. So he wanted to have this piece of the cake, but still he never took those concepts to heart. And I think the main discovery and what we could thank Freud for, besides understanding like through the errors of the case studies is if we could take a theoretical concept part, it would be the death drive. What's interesting about what you said about a closed system to relate it to Mino, it's making me think that what Socrates is doing is not celebrating the episteme or ep right. episteme as such and saying that the uh, aspired to notion of a science of virtue is lacking necessarily or wanting, but maybe it is those coherent bodies of knowledge that are in themselves failures in as much as they're coherent, whereas virtue itself may be saying, I don't know this for sure, I'm not an uh, expert on Socrates and Plato, but maybe that 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 virtue is supreme because it cannot be systematized into an episteme. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Like you see like the history of philosophy, they get away from virtue and it, in the morality kind of truth to like, you know, I mean, I don't know if really Descartes had anything of like a system of ethics, but then you have like Leibniz, kind of using these like weird, in a sense you could call them mappings of like a value judgment with mathematics of, 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 a, of a good and bad action or good and evil action. Um, but like for the most part, we get away from these notions of virtue into more of like with Kant categorical imperatives and on the Anglo-Saxon side utilitarianism what brings the maximum amount of pleasure and, and, and well-being versus the least amount of pain, right? The greatest good for the most people. Yeah, it shifts. Because there's really no, because it does go down to not correspondence three in, in, as far as the epistemic, but uh, statements and propositions that have coherency, which is something that even gets adopted in logical positivism. It's all about coherency for the most I mean, maybe not all, but okay, so it seems like it is. What you just made me think of is how in the Mino, like what's happening here is we have this demonstration of a certain kind of the nature of knowledge, what could be a more coherent episteme than mathematics itself yeah what could be more more fixed eternally true um and you know on plato's divided line mathematics and is second to last of the forms themselves so it's as close as you get to the formal reality of the um yes a a dos. but what what just occurs to me is that what's fascinating is it's sort of like what does virtue have to do with that? Well, arete is, of course, the uh, per perfection of 
any specific, uh, let, let's say, I can't think of a good way to phrase this, but root that um, a specific organism might take or, a spe- or, or what is best for any um, a, a sp- specific branch of knowledge in terms of its own perfectibility. But what's fascinating about what's happening with the slave child and Socrates is that he is revealing their not just the virtue in its ethical dimension, but also what is the arete of the episteme of knowledge itself? Does that make yeah. sense? Like yeah. that is what's being revealed. What does that have to do with psychoanalysis? Well, it has to do with the fact that the goal of psychoanalysis, which is not, which it uh, defies closure in a sense has to do with, as we always talk about, the status of knowledge itself. Right. And so what's getting put into question in the next page, because really on this page, was it 14? It's just a lot of talking um, for the most part. And we kind of just expanded on a lot of it, even on our own accords. But right here, we get into what Manoni's comments have to say about the, the function of orthodoxia or what Courier brings about and the main thing that he has a hard time understanding, the homie Manoni, is that, you know, with the Platonic dialogue, we're dealing with a, a truth, a forgotten truth, brought about by the Myutics. But it's an eternal truth nonetheless. Nonetheless, even if it's, you know, uh, forgotten and it's remembered. With um, psychoanalysis, it's about a historical truth of the subject. But... It seems like Lacan wants to say that now they're, they're, they have the same formal structure, nonetheless, right? Wait, I just I just figured out what I was trying to articulate before is that he, the but the the if you read Mino, it seems as if okay, as it said before, it's like there there is this failure, right? To be able to uh, yeah. identify a specific practitioner of virtue of exactly because, because of virtue but i i just want to say it's like uh but you would th- you would come away from that thinking okay well then there's like something that's insufficient but no that what you could what you're mi- what is easy to miss is that no virtue is more powerful than any of these episteme in that arite virtue itself is the virtue of what knowledge is aspiring to, it is the condition of all of these forms of knowledge. And that is what you're missing if you think that it's just, okay, this this dialogue uh, is a failure. This dialogue right. ends at, at an impasse and there's no answer. It's like, you're, you're missing what he's getting at. Yeah. All of these different bodies of knowledge, the reason that we can't find out what the episteme of virtue is, is because virtue is the condition of all of these right. epistemic yeah and, and, sorry go and, no no i was just gonna say it's like going back to the epistemic as far as when he says about coherency or a coherent body that he's he's socrates is forcing him to ask you know is, is what does like virtue correspond to or like what who is like the teacher like as far as there's a teacher of virtue well, well, what is it that he's teaching and what does it correspond to exactly and he could only give like particular examples. And so then he puts in the question with the definition of virtue, and then he's forced to give a definition in the level of coherency, which also fails. So you have two parts of epistemology that fail at giving an answer, Co- correspondence to a specific reality or object, the coherency uh, truth statement. Does that sound correct? Is that no, at least that's, how I That's answer. very good. I. I... I think talk about mirror. I think we're 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 mirroring each other here. Uh, it's very difficult to but get at what we're talking about. It's like you're saying it's a condition for all that. I was like, damn, that's good. I, well, it's like this is the thing about analysis. It it ends up ultimately sort of like swallowing it itself in a sense. It's like it's an Ouroboros 
Yeah. It's like the, the, what? Hey, let's, let's not get too Jungian right there. Let's not. No, no, no. Well, well, that's what Young misses, right? Though, is because he wants to make like discrete parts out of this thing. Talk about a closed system. It's attractive, but yeah. this is where, where something sets the parameters of its own evaluation in some sense of, of, of its own test of its own truth yeah and this is where where knowledge comes in and it's like it's it that that's what's going on in the mino that like i think you can it's easy to miss and so it's, it's like what what makes like so socratic dialogue so brilliant and fun to read and worth like revisiting again and again is that if you just think that oh here's a curious guy who's just being like well what if there's not gods or what if there are did you ever think about this it's like no no that's just like a that's a dentist attitude socrates is as far from being a dentist as you could get because actually there is a kind of conclusion even in the most inconclusive dialogues if, if i is trained yeah it was funny that they were bringing up dentists because the other day i went to the, the dentist on base to get a cleaning <laughs> it just made me think of this dialogue <laughs> Or just like the previous chapter when he's like, you know, the, the dentist and the cojito. Hey, I mean, they got, they, they'll give you nitros. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God bless them for that. Cause yeah, that was just a thing. It wasn't like a surgery or anything. <laughs> I haven't been to the dentist in years, but now that I've got some coverage, uh, well, let's see. Hopefully there's not too many cavities to fill, but I, I am fond of my my uh, Sour Patch Kids. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew just shuddered because that's something that like he cannot allow himself with it. Oh, I know. I love Sour Patch Kids. Those are good. Um, yeah, I do the... My form of ketosis is a Sour Patch Ketosis. Well, you, you think of like uh, freaking... What's the motto? Right? First they're sour, then they're sweet then they're gone or whatever that's like you know psychoanalysis they come in sour then they leave sweet <laughs> or then they're sweet and then they're gone <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, and and did they even exist to begin with <laughs> exactly uh so we talk about this idea of orthodoxa yeah. where the word orthodox comes from we talked about this already it's like the correct opinion right opinion doxa is something that plato especially like you know he wants to get away from he wants to abstract away from that to something that's like more um solid and reliable and like fixed because opinion is always a poor approximation of some sort of eternal truth so you like at the same time it seems like Socrates here, well, he's not totally against orthodoxa and Plato in, later on his career, like he doesn't want to, he doesn't think that everyone can become a philosopher or wants to do away with uh, doxa, but he wants to have doxa grounded in eternal right. truths. The right, he wants it, it to be actual right opinion because he doesn't have much faith in individuals to actually like aspire to this higher form of knowledge yeah. like let's be I'll honest Althusser had some had some words for plato in that sense yeah. of, like he makes it <laughs> you know at the core reactionary yeah. uh <laughs> this is you know now we're getting into some complicated stuff here and what this has to do with beyond the pleasure principle i do not know yet hopefully he'll um connect it a little bit later on when we talk about that more specifically but i like this here where he says and it's interesting because he's bringing the master's discourse into here you can see how bad a pupil mino is when he says if gorgias were here he would explain all this to us he'd be yeah. knocked over by what gorgias said and to this day this is how people present intellectual arguments many right. times deferring to well like i can't explain it but the name of the father yeah does the job in a sense exactly or like you know 
you know, let, let's criticize Zizek on uh, his supposed transphobic, but let's not talk about, let's not bring the question to him. Let's ask somebody else to speak for him. <laughs> Like the yeah. name of the father is present in that argument. Like what happened <laughs> recently? Let's ask Zupan. Yeah, I was gonna bring up names, but <laughs> if if uh, you know, you know, yeah. yeah oh, you, know, you know. Because she's apparently she was deputized to. And she's she, yeah. she's <laughs> But uh. That is funny though that <laughs> gorgeous. He's bringing up gorgeous. Like if gorgeous were here, you could say it's like, well, then yeah, you are a bad people. Because aren't you supposed to be the same? Like a little kid, like yeah. <laughs> if my dad were here. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, and it's funny. It's like some form of that argument. Yeah. Or, or that response continues to exist throughout adult life. It just doesn't. We never say our dads, but it's like some kind of dad-like presence we invoke whenever we're cornered you know uh, and, and, yeah. and as true as that is it's like it also makes me think it's like how straw man is are the softest to, to plato in this and these entire dialogues <laughs> that's a good that's a really yeah. good question um yeah and like i think that the sophists actually get a bad rap because it's like the sophists it's like you know what's interesting about that it makes me think of how jordan peterson talks about cultural marxists yeah like sophist is a, a similar sort of denomination that is like too much of an umbrella term whereas like you get some interesting sophists that like weren't that that, that didn't necessarily have anything to do with each other other than maybe well i guess like they there's almost like a capitalist critique here isn't it they, they charged right yeah for what they did but you have everybody from like you know protagoras to prodicus to they all came from like a certain certain uh you know nobility status though so you know they were well up in in athens so that that's why they probably get conglomerated together and people are willing to pay to learn from them and it's like you see this is like with now you got like the intellectual dark web a sophist but it's like not even the, now you get like the whole group of like from red tube to like you know all these other things where everybody wants to, to claim mastery like i could teach you this follow my patreon <laughs> right exactly but yeah but right that's a really good point but the the point socrates i don't think socrates is saying well they have no good ideas nothing they say has right. weight or merit but more so they aren't interested in this question of virtue and what is what does any of this matter if we aren't considering virtue who's even the thinker of virtue right right it'll right. have to be me but of course again what's interesting about that is that socrates himself is always subverting mastery right he never positions himself as the master we already know he's ugly and probably smells <laughs> and he's like always positioning himself as someone who is um the you know the most ignorant of anyone yeah and people are very annoyed by him too <laughs> and people are annoyed by him and lacan points out it's like he went a little too he strayed a little too far from orthodoxa and yeah. suffered the consequences for that reason but uh this is a this is a very difficult chapter in that like it's he especially because we weren't there for the lecture given yeah on, on the mino so i think that would help us illuminate exactly what points he's trying to yeah the homie corrie but he reminds me lacan reminds me of zizek here and that like zizek all um, anticipates whatever you think because he does deal with the same themes again and again same examples again and again but he always seeks to like undermine the uh, predictability of using those examples in a way that's like, well, you you think I'm going to say this, and I, I say something different. I twist it in a way that you <laughs> going to expect. Right. Lacan seems to be doing the same sort of thing, where it's like, 
oh, okay, you could read the Mino and think, oh, oh, I see. It's like you have the retroactivity of him, uh, of Myudix, and in that we have something like psychoanalysis. But um, at another point, he says, actually, Mino is the, the analyst here, not Socrates. Mm, interesting, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what he meant by that. I mean, well, that's what I was bringing up too, because because it's like, well, at one point, is as far as like Socrates is the person in que- or or not in question, but the person positing the questions, he's mirroring like the uh, hysterics discourse, but then like when he takes the slave boy he assumes the analyst discourse because he's not he's not telling him anything he's always like asking him these questions that have open ends so that it allows them to come up with an response a response that they build up in themselves all he needs to know is that that person knows greek that slave knows greek and in a sense it's a pedagogy and i think you know maybe our this is like i don't know yeah who knows if the homie was Alexander Cormier, right? Cormier? Cormier, Cormier. Cormier. yeah. <laughs> no, you, you actually point out something really interesting. There is a moment in that dialogue where he's like, does he know Greek? You know? Because that's all he needs to know, right? He just speak, and then he's giving them these open-ended questions. He only gets them a little bit of information, but just enough to make them like, build up the answers and the truth of himself, but it always starts off with error. And that's the thing with analysis, right? The truth arises from error. That was like the last chapter that we went over. Right, right. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. And it's funny, he brings up the Mino in that one too. He's like, he's like, he's just gonna give us a little piece of this. And then the homie uh Corrier is like, all right, I'll spit this Mino real quick. And the next day they start talking about it. I mean, just the fact that uh, what's fascinating also is that there are in the ancient world and ancient literature, whether it's Roman or Greek, there there are no barely any depictions of slaves and like slaves are reduced to the level of animal like you just as soon ask a cow what they think as you would a slave. They're completely dehumanized. Right. And even uh, Aristotle thought like that too. Like absolutely. Aristotle. I mean, these are they're like they're all like fucking. They're all PMCs, basically. Yeah. Even when we're talking but, about, they're all fucking Plato. thinkers. But yeah. Socrates comes as close as you get to actually, in a very strangely radical way, like subjectivizing um, what the ancient Romans called like the something like instrumentum uh, vocal. I think it was like the yeah. it, basically the speaking tool. Was yes. It, and, and playing this into like more of the political aspect, when you think about modern day, it's like most of the working class that want to, that hate the liberals, they get so close and then they fail. And they're just like, you know, the government is controlling us, you know, just look at all these things from after 9-11 with, you know, then the housing market, you know, the, the, and they'll say the stock market crashed, but they never talk, they'll never talk about like the capitalists. They're just, it's the banks. And then they fail at that because they only want to blame the banks, but they never want to say like, well, what are the banks grounded on? And then it's like, oh, you know, COVID and, and it really it's pharma and we just all need to rally up together and look out for one another, right? All these, you know, honest workers that work for a living that have families. So support the small business because the small businesses are what make society because at the end of the day, it's these uh, global elites there's the failure right there. So it's like the small business. What allows one to be a businessman in the first place? Is it capitalism? Because again, the yeah, corporate form of the exactly. businessman. <laughs> it, it, I'm just spitballing, but it's like there's like where like it leads to failure. But like again, they're working class people. They're not any PMCs or anything. Do they listen to PMCs? Yes, but at the end of the day, it's like they're normal working class people, but they have these reactionary takes, which kind of come close to something towards a critique of political economy, very close. And then they fail because they don't want to talk about political economy or capitalism. It's only exactly. big pharma. 
exactly. only the one percent. Right, right. There, there's ultimately a displacement because it's like, even if Big Pharma, it's obviously evil, but Fauci, <laughs> there's a displacement onto Big Pharma as the the face of it. You want a face to, yeah. It, but like, I think what's what's going on here, what's fascinating is that like, it, we can't um, neglect the fact that it's a a slave boy who's being called upon. Right. demonstrate the nature of knowledge because this is someone who is su supposed to be an object essentially right right and the 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 last person in the world who is meant to be in, in any way attuned to any epistemic mm -hmm. so that you know you you, you can't subtract the social status of yeah, the yeah. slave from from the fact of the um from from the fact of this demonstration of the way knowledge works and i think that's another element that we could see this from mm -hmm. that that's a thought that that i had no there. you're 100 percent correct he's not supposed to know but Actors is like, what does the boy speak? That's it. Then, okay, this part, hopefully you can help me with this because I got a little right. bit lost. I'm, I, 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 I have a lot of respect for Ippolit. Ippolit's like the man. Actually. Yeah, he's a G. He's a G. Like, J. Cole hit me. <laughs> right. I, I, now I picture him as J. Cole because you're a meme. Like, <laughs> It believe like don't sleep on it. Believe like he no. believes like inspect the deck. Yeah, like he it, he yeah. spits, but he just doesn't get as much shine. But like yeah. he's necessary. Like he he's hystericizing Lacan. That's what, it was exactly what I was about to say. He does the best job of hystericizing Lacan. <laughs> like has the the balls to do it. Essentially, yeah. like not everybody does it. Yeah, but um, he makes a really interesting point here that I don't quite get but like he says we're perverted by christianity which makes us locate a given eternal truth as antecedent whereas platonism following to a great extent the movement which we might call historicity shows us that the invention of the symbol once invented turns out to be an external past and so i was saying before yeah. zizek <laughs> quoting x files the truth is out there versus um whatever he's saying is this given eternal truth um i don't know what do you make of this so yeah like like the truth is out there is like well the cave right it's, it's, uh, the the true they want to say true world but escaping the cave the allegory of the cave the truth is out there outside of the cave it's the platonist but then what does he say he's like the perversion of, of christianity um antecedent just means after right so it's like the truth oh, is well, not antecedent, an antecedent actually is something that comes uh, before actually before oh actually so it's the fact it's like that it's the truth is in god god come before us and we are born by the grace of god right and even that when you take genesis right the fall of man came before us all and the truth is that we're in sin so now we must make up for it right and at least for christianity it's like there are no works it's all about having faith surrendering to jesus christ and that the kingdom of heaven is within right as long as you're the only work you have to do is just have faith and pray not even pray but just faith right that's it but that the truth came before you. The truth was always before you, before anybody, because God is eternal. I think that is what it means by that. Right. It, it's eternal, but it, it has this exteriority that is unlike anything known in, in Christianity. And I, I know, I remember in Ticklish Subject, Zizek defines God as absolute closure in a sense whereas here we have something that's like a kind of opening that, that 
it has nothing yeah. like sort of like closure uh that, that's what i sort of well thinking about it is like at least if we thought as far as you follow like the the biblical text it's like and i'm about to be on my really william lane craig shit but it's like there's both the cause and the beginning right and both are god so god is the cause of the world but he also is the beginning so mm. that still comes before us right 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 well damn beginning cause yeah two different things that he wants to distinguish in his arguments still a Thomist argument right nonetheless that's the perversion of some platonism that hippolyte wants to bring into an account but what like it's funny because it's the same sort of haziness that we're met with when trying to understand the ego yeah or socrates what is uh knowledge without, right. without obviously it's not like to like no god because they're they're gods there's something and, and um, here's the what argument is knowledge for platonism without god being uh, here's or, the argument also against platonism too against the christians is divine aseity of, of of that god is the word and the word of god that that means is that god is his own cause right and that pretty much if you look at like Timaeus, like the demiurge is not the real god like the one the good the beautiful that triangular thing right the perfect geometrical form that's in a sense it's like you know there's no like time there's no cause in the same way of Asadi, but Asadi for god means that the truth and also the cause of the world. So they take that the creator of the world is also the true God. That doesn't have a cause. That's self-cause. That's the argument against Platonism. Okay. So yes. then what for Socrates here, let's say it's a just like Plato, like what for Socrates is the... Well, Socrates. Well, where, not, where does knowledge go, and where does it come from? Right. It's not God. Well, well, what, what you got to think with Plato himself, he was a Pythagorean. So, when we take knowledge as remembering, it's remembering the soul from previous lives because he was a proponent of metempsychosis, which we can yes. think of as kind of like rebirth, reincarnation type thing. Transmigration. Yes exactly but for an analysis it's not anything to do with a past life what it is is to do with like certain instances of of your past right yourself as a child as an adolescent right in which certain there are certain things that you know affected you you know you have the effective aspect of yourself but but putting a signifier to it, I think is the main point in, in working through and historicizing yourself. And, and, you know, it's definitely retroactive in that sense, in remembering. But here's the thing going back to like it's not like correspondent to a coherent reality out there, but so far as it's like represents a discourse that reveals something about the subject. The subject finally gets named. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you said it all there. <laughs> Fucking bars right there. Yeah. <laughs> Brought up the metempsychosis. Yeah. <laughs> any, for any readers of Ulysses, <laughs> Molly Bloom says, met him Who's he, Who's he when he's at home? Meaning, Damn. what does that mean? Met him. <laughs> and Leopold Bloom says, metempsychosis, the transmigration of the souls. Exactly. One of the main themes of, of Ulysses, metempsychosis. Right. Um, look, look at me trying to flex over here. The fact that we both brought up metempsychosis and that you even knew what it was, that's a flex. <laughs> Synchronicity, yo, realize, realize, real life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was bars. 
That's what but I think like also like what like I wanted to bring up too, like you kind of see this like Willa Khan is flexing the three registers right here when he's talking about like the whole geometrical thing of what Socrates is putting into question with the state boy is that at one point he's given certain statements where like he gets wrong, but then there's like an intuition that comes out, but then there's something that isn't on the realm of, of I guess the imaginary, maybe it's the affect of imaginary plane or register when he brings up like the whole thing about like, uh, what is it, the irrational number of the square root of two, that that's something that takes more of a, I think he says like in a, a symbolic register, which doesn't involve intuition, but evolves more like admission into the symbolic where you could, you have to learn it pretty much. It doesn't come naturally. Like saying like, oh, a two plus two equals four. Like, to, nope. to know and understand and to, to get to something called a uh, square root of two. Yep. Yeah. Or admission. Yep. And this, this is what we were talking Not about. Not included. It's a, yeah. it's a priori synthetic. Yeah. And, yeah. and like exactly. the kind of knowledge, the knowledge that emerges from analysis is also a priori synthetic in the way Zizek often talks about this. How can something be, necessary and contingent at the same time right and right retroactively necessary though it emerges from the contingent mm -hmm. uh all right we have like four pages left is it gets like really obscure here and like i feel like there are certain uh, subtexts that like i'm not picking up on especially because it's like, a, again, you know, we're dealing with like the most like, uh, uh, how would I put it? Like affected, affectedly sophisticated. Right. Frenchmen of the time, like really trying to impress each other. So they're all the, these like little, and they also come from this sort of, I guess, kind of like Dadaist tradition. Yeah. Like where they, they're very aware of the signifiers they're using mm -hmm. and like like here like they have um you know why do we say operant versus operational it's like i don't know what any of that means yeah. i feel like they're they're getting into like at a certain point like really highly sophisticated sort of yeah. uh, salon speak i would call it of just like very rarefied references and things like that where a part of this it just it just escapes me yeah i mean if, if it's really necessary not really because again like i think with a point for at least for this episode it's like we touched upon the main idea of this entire chapter i think if anything i really want to touch on this la these last couple of pages I where just get annoyed, um, though. Pont Alice, Pont Alice really talks about the pleasure principle or beyond pleasure. Is that here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, in section two on uh, page 21. Because we're on 20 oh, right Right, now. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. here he says something like, I don't understand. It's like if Themistocles and Pericles were good psychoanalysts and like who's a psychoanalyst? Yeah. Like, I literally don't know what the fuck they're talking about here with like why Pericles and Themistocles. Well, what are you saying? It's like, why is like, you know, I don't mean to say that state, yes, yeah, statesman is a psychoanalyst. Uh, yeah it's like who with the states begins to construct a science of politics and, and god knows where it has led us since <laughs> that's just a joke about <laughs> about politics that i think is pretty funny <laughs> yeah but, but i don't get this whole like we're pericles psychoanalysts and like they were born psychoanalysts and they weren't psychoanalyzed like i'm not following this i'm i i, I think yeah, it's definitely hard, but like if I had to shoot from the hip, it's the fact it's like, um, it's also the question of like, who's a good psychoanalyst, but also who could be psychoanalyzed as well. And it's like, are, is one also born a psychoanalyst if that's the case? Because it's like, if that's the case, because you got to think it's like, psychoanalysts also under an, an, uh, analysis themselves, right? So it's like, 
they're constantly historicizing themselves while they are also the quote unquote subject matter expert. No, I'm just trying to understand what it has to do with Themistocles or Pericles in that context. It doesn't. This just seems like they're just flexing, like you. They're said. just flexing because it because I can see here that yeah they're they're flexing on each other and then he says like well it will take him some time to be Spartacus about the slave boy you know what I mean yeah. it's kind of like I can see that they're they're just sparring in a way you yeah. know trying to impress each other <laughs> they're battle rapping each other pretty much yeah yeah basically like these are like subliminals almost yeah they're URL pretty much <laughs> but like I do like this thing where he, he uses the English word gentleman apparently here where it's like right. you know, like Socrates would be turned out because he stepped a little too far out mm -hmm. of line from the society of um of gentlemen. Yeah. And and uh right was, right Nick thing. And, or, or, or Dave and I were talking about like humanism and stuff like that and liberalism. Like gentlemen was one of like a society of not like um you were well mannered. It's like you were well mannered because you knew things, because you had a certain knowledge and expertise. That's what made you a gentleman. Um, and then in Latin, right, you get a, a a liberal, one who's liberated by, you mm. know, the humanities, by philosophy. Yeah. In the Renaissance Italy, right, uh, the, a liberal that was one who was liberated, and made them gentle. They weren't the brutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good point. Like they invented these wine glasses that were um, so fragile back in the day. I saw this from a School of Life video, by the way. <laughs> but they they invented these these someone created these wine glasses that were so fragile that you had no choice but to drink from them carefully, to, like demonstrate your refinement, lest you shatter the glass by being, you know. <laughs> But uh, guess what? You need a lot of privilege to be thinking like that. Let's get to beyond yeah. the pleasure. The homie JP Bontelli. What is pleasure to you? Is it drinking a Coke? <laughs> drinking some Coke? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Fucking uh, Miller High Life. <laughs> The champagne of beers that exactly. that's the last thing that uh little known fact i have um direct line to some people that are very close to Lacan, and you know they say that like he whispered something in his mistress's ear before he died right which was like the truth of his entire system and i know for a fact i'm about to reveal right now that what he said was that uh yeah uh miller high life is the champagne of beers <laughs> That should be a meme, bro. That should, that should be a meme. <laughs> Champagne. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> and then he expired. <laughs> <laughs> That's the traditional psychoanalysis. <laughs> Good beer. It is. Um, <laughs> refreshing. I prefer the 40 in the glass. Yeah. In California, they were serving them in, like, it wasn't actually 40 ounce. They were serving... They were selling 38 ounces and they were in plastic. It was absurd. 38 ounces? Yeah, in Wait. plastic. What? Why? I, they got like outlawed for a little bit. Like, so if you went to 7 Eleven in California, you wouldn't get a 40 ounce of High Life. You would get a 30, it was like a 36 or a 38 ounce, mm. but in plastic. Yeah. In plastic. Yeah, I remember because my dad used to get those. I'm like, what happened to the glass ones? Like, they're 40. He's like, yeah, they, they apparently they, they're uh, they're not allowed to sell them anymore. But then they came back. I remember the 32 ounces. That was a yeah, because because the 32 ounce has a long neck, and then the the 40 ounce is like you know comes down like just a regular 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a yeah. damn. It's been a while. They just, yeah, I gotta get I gotta get one of those. To get a good old Colt 45. All English still reserves. <laughs> Got them all, my friend. Um, let's see. Uh, right here, though, we get into like the splitting of the ego, which I think is 
really well first he's like bringing up the like the topographical thing of like you know ego super ego id right but then like what's important is like this notion of splitting of the ego i'm not sure how um freud's definition is but i know for instance it's like for melanie klein the splitting of the ego is a defense mechanism you know, like the rejection of the good and the bad object um which happens a lot. It's a schizoid feature, but it doesn't mean that you're, schi you're schizophrenic. Um, but like certain things that you reject, get it's a splitting. And I think the other aspect gets put into the unconscious. But it just shows right there as like an example of like the decentering of the ego in another aspect. I think the splitting of the ego is like something of the early middle Freud because then we're getting into like um obviously the death drive let's see right here at least the definitions a term used by freud to denote a very specific phenomenon which he deemed to be at work above all a fetishism and in the psychosis the coexistence at the heart of the ego of two psychical attitudes towards external reality. And so far as this stands in the way of an instinctual, instinctual demand, the first of these two attitudes takes uh, reality into consideration while, oh, one attitude takes reality into consideration while the second disavows it, replaces it by a product of desire. The two attitudes persist side by side without influencing each other. So a more fancier way of saying that. But it seems like this kind of builds up to something later on, which he would talk about as far as like drive and death drive. Right, but it we're not yet at the split subject. Right, well, as far as like not split subject, as far as like you have the unconscious on one hand, the ego and this gap, this ontological gap, which gets talked about in like seminar 11. I think it's so far as like the ego and part of the defense mechanisms, which is not conscious, it's more unconscious. The ego, I don't know that I'm splitting without realizing it, but certain acts myself get rejected and put into the unconscious. And it almost seems like, well, if there's a disavowal, it seems like maybe that is another way of talking about Bernardino. Mm. It's hard to, it's so hard to get away from this notion of the ego as like the basement. Yeah. Because you just like habitually resort to that sort of image to understand where it's like, where does all this stuff go? Well, it goes into the basement of the unconscious, but that isn't yeah. what's going on necessarily. Um, I don't know. That's just something that occurred to me. Yeah, because it's like the unconscious is not like some internal thing within me. It's not this necky of like Jung, where it's like we're going right. into this under right, the dream world. What it is, is like, because we said that the truth is out there, the X-Files thing that Jesha points out, the unconscious is out there because it's part of the symbolic order, right? And that's the question, the next chapter is like where the symbolic order or the yeah. unconscious emerges within the symbolic order. Because what is unconscious is the drive, the death drive, which brings about the return of the repressed. And I think that's what we have to pinpoint and at least it seems like that's what they're working with right because you're trying to understand the difference of the ego and the unconscious and the, the way that the ego operates in the splitting right right you already right. decentered it it's not autonomous to the world but then you have these other things in so far as it becomes decentered it tries to split itself it tries to split itself yeah hmm you want to, but it seems like it's already. If we take that the ego is misrecognition, there's already this alienation, right? Because we talked about in seminar one the primary and secondary narcissism. The secondary 
has its admission into the symbolic order. Or that so, so far as you're born, you're thrown into the world, you're thrown into a uh, referential language, but then it's like, at what point does misrecognition arise? And then that's where like you have alienation, but then like, so far as you're alienated by like this fragmented image, it's constant mapping of the body, because the body is, is supposed to be that image of the ego, but it's never like a, a totalized body. It's always a body that's always partial or fragmented. And then that misrecognition, you continuously split depending upon your certain symptoms, right? Are you tracking? The fault line. Yeah. Split depends on your specific symptom. It, it, it seems like it. That's what I'm trying to get at. And, and I mean, he does mention psychosis right there in that definition of the language of psychoanalysis, but it, I'm thinking more of like in neuroses. But then again, if we're thinking about like the registers, it's like at what point is the knot twist to where there's this entanglement between a neurotic structure and even the possibility of psychosis? Because it seems like psychosis, melancholia, perversion, neuroses, the more the knots twist, and then like, you know, if you have like modern Lacanians like Leon Brenner, autism, like if you, these knots are twisting in different ways, it's like, at what point do these things intersect? These clinical structures as things in you. Right, yeah. Um, especially because certain symptoms can have the appearance of a perverse symptom and right. don't necessarily uh, indicate the the structure that they appear to be mm -hmm. yes and right here like so like first of all he's talking about like traumatic uh neurosis because that was like the discovery of like the death drive like the war trauma right and um right here he was he bring up the uh fort da of um said so the game endlessly repeated by children there's a famous example of an 18 month old child left by his mother and whom each time throws away an object or retrieves it again a process of continual disappearance and reappearance the child tries to make tries to take an active role in the situation but what this is a metaphor of and like you'll say right here is like in the transference it's like it's only in the transference does there can begin to exist a constant repetition to repeat because that's where the unconscious as far as the symbolic order is not just like the fact that we were living in the symbolic order but that the symbolic order becomes more apparent in this relation between the analyst and the analyzan that when there's transference in the, in the the symbol emerges and projects onto the screen the blank slate of the analyst then there is this working of the unconscious and it allows for the analyzan to constantly repeat so that they can work through, especially not only in like when they, they free associate, their speech fails by slips of the tongues or forgetting the specific names, the failure of empty speech, but also in dreams, the constant repetitions. Like, why do you continuously have this dream where in the scene, you're at the school, or you're at this house okay. with this person? Yeah. What does that have to do with the Mino? I think what it is is the, the fact is like there is this his, well, so the first thing was right, we have to distinguish between the eternal truth and the, the historical truth, right? That was what Minoni was trying to get at. But the form in which, so long as like now you're getting into the heart of psychoanalysis about like the subject in question, there are certain questions that it have to be asked. But it's like there's always a right timing, right? And, it, and it's weird, it's like, I wonder if Manoni is right to an extent and Hippolyte hystericizing Lacan. I think Lacan may be working through some error himself, but the fact of the matter is like, there is a truth that needs to be remembered or brought into speech. And at least it's only remembered as so long as it's symbolized because repression is forgot. And then you forget that you forgot 
as we talked about in seminar one by bringing Heidegger's Aletheia into there and Lethe. But when there is this compulsion to repeat, you begin to remember because it's constantly happening. It's not happening random in different parts of your life, but it's happening constantly in the session because of the conditions permitted. The virtue of analysis allow that to happen in the transference. I think I just had something of an epiphany with like the way you just connected compulsion to repeat with the transference. I'd never thought the two together in that way. And it's like, yeah. like the transference is a form of repetition. It's like you, you rope the analyst into a specific dynamic in which you repeat a, a foundational experience. Right in a sense and like the keen analyst is going to be aware of the is going to see the I, I hesitate to say pattern because it sounds a little too like cbt but like at least yeah the the exact um you know pathology flavor of this yeah. what would you call it it's just like the pathology is constantly repeating like and it and it's you know it's a specific scenario almost yeah. it's like you're brought you're bringing someone back to like a a, a into a specific scenario again and again right. recreating the scenario and all the symbolic coordinates of that scenario again and again no matter what the mm -hmm. and, and what's resisting symbolization is the real but the, the more that it's repeating the more that the real is going to be known and and what matters is the fact of the transfer that's why it's like the four fundamental concepts right are unconscious drive uh transference of repetition and they all have some type of uh appearance and encountering real and the real is that which resists it's like especially when we take that the unconscious is look is analogous with the drive and the drive appears and then vanishes it's like temporal much like um in if you if you check my uh free, free beer tomorrow the ig like the um passage of uh latin dollar dollar that i posted um where he talk where he talks about the long and the slip and how that describes yeah describes in that exactly what you're talking about something that appears and is gone and for da they're gone right in that uh it's gone the moment it appears yes and, it, and, and i think how the, the, how the unconscious shows itself that's where it rears its head exactly and what they're grappling with right here is like with repetition if there is something called a pleasure principle then like why is it need to repeat especially if we have this problem of the biologizing of death drive as a death instinct with Freud, right? And ultimately, I think what they're trying to say is that we need to divorce this biologizing and we can still see, he'll say, if we put it into the realm of the human world that, uh, you know, then we can understand this. And he says it on this one here. This warning session here that we need to opt out for um, biology for the human. Because there's no way you could talk about, like, in the science of the day of, of evolutionary biology, a death instinct, what? I mean, we know we die, but, you know, this instinct towards death is drive towards destruction. And so that is, like, the problem that they're dealing with. You need to redefine also what death is, and this is why... Right. What's interesting is that I don't know if this is directly related to what we're talking about right now, but it just occurred to me. It's just like this idea of death only exists with the symbolic. And mm -hmm. I think what Kana and other points is like animals perish, but human beings die. Exactly. So to understand what the death drive is, you have to rethink what death is. It isn't the biological expiration of right. the organism, but it is a symbolic fate uh-huh and and he mentions right here one that we have to render the distinction between need and drive 
but right here in this page, you just talk about like to understand, um, you know, what's going, what we're underlining, we need to differentiate between the biological register and the human register. And it's the thing we're getting at is what makes us human is this death drive, this undermining is probably part of the pathogenic nucleus that makes us human, the symptom part and excellence you know, of the ego. Yeah, yeah, because if you think about what the, the stupidity of animals, and I'm sorry for animal lovers to say that way, but it's like the, the, the stupidity yeah. that's like <laughs> that they they own like but it's not stupid in the sense of like what we we're talking about with behaviorism before and the teleology of behaviorism, where it's sort of like, well, wouldn't it make sense to just um try to get what you need and like you know, be driven towards those lures that uh, are conducive to obtaining what you need to procreate and eat. And that's what animals are doing all the time. Uh, I'm sure some people could debate that, but it's like, but it, it's in the fact that we don't simply aim at getting what it is we need to keep ourselves alive to self-preserve that makes us human right like that's what is interesting about us is the fact that we self-sabotage exactly and, you know just to bring it back to like cbt simps and all that it's just sort of like well how can i get out of my own way how can i get out of my own way like think about even the phrasing of that sentence is like building healthy habits better habits. building health building healthy habits better Make habits. A better self right 12 12 rules for life how about that? Right. That's why he wants us to be more like lobsters because they have it figured out, right? right. They they have a very efficient system and they apparently, um, I mean, he's probably, you know, for all the hate we give him, he's probably not wrong about what he has to say about lobsters. And if, if human beings were purely self-interested beings then maybe we should try to be like lobsters but the fact is he's missing that dimension of the unconscious right. where we our greatness is that um and this is why i think nietzsche loved like wagner so much is is not like the grandiosity of what the nazis made of wagner in terms of just like conquest and mastery but uh, the fact that in every act of attempted mastery is the 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 beauty of a kind of failure yeah the tragedy which is why like his tragedy. first work about the tragedy and, and and bringing that element mixing bog greek tragedy right which you would definitely disavow that work because of that and the amount of schopenhauer and metaphysics to use with like the dualism of apollonian dionysian but like he never really lets go of the Dionysian principle that he becomes a Dionysian rebel like that is his theme because it's affirming life even in tragedy like ecstasy is in tragedy and in the creative beauty of life in intoxication the intoxication death, death drive death drive yeah. is an affirmation of life yeah and it's actually something that Schopenhauer says like even suicide is the ultimate act of the will to life yeah in that um it it something something that serves no purpose and, that, and that's also a definition of jouissance jouissance serves no purpose right I, I wouldn't say like it would you could align it with schopenhauer in that since i think schopenhauer actually really meant it like as far as like he really thought like not being born was the best thing he was like more like he was least, yeah. Anti yeah antinatalism Right, right. Yeah. yeah, to echo, actually, it's interesting because yeah, Sophocles is the author of Oed Oedipus. Uh, yeah, it, it's better better to not have been born at all is the happiest fate you can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is, is there anything else we want to say? No, I, I think oh. I'm pretty much... Uh done on, on, on at least what I want to say I think like the last thing was pointed out like as far as like the last page is like you know having to decipher between um a biological register versus the human register which is what psychoanalysis can be aligned with 
we need to get rid to understand depth drive or to understand technique we need to separate biologism from it for it to work because so many people after freud whether or not they agreed with the death drive in this case straight you with death instinct but everybody else who was not on board with it was still trying to do psychoanalysis but trying to ground things in some type of biological register right right and part of the reason for that is that freud didn't like he did he wanted psychoanalysis to be a science like other sciences right, right. he believed that once neuroscience and neurobiology had developed to a certain point that there wouldn't even be a need for psychoanalysis but the thing is it's like the terror that he made in the episteme let's say was one that he was not equipped to deal with because he wasn't aware of what he had even done but he was also aware to a certain degree he couldn't actually subjectivize his own um what he had affected he was not able to truly subjectivize in a strange way and that's what's fascinating about i think this is what lacan's pointing out so those who came after him that tried to biologize what he was what he was doing were also trying to follow a certain tendency in his thought where he he had aspired to his hope was that what he he was pursuing would ultimately be you know um if this is a word like synthesizable with uh the the science of the time and he he he, just to bring it back to oppenheimer became (laughs) I am become a uh, death drive or something, yeah. you know, like he, he didn't, he wasn't able to fully register what it was that uh, he, he created right. there. And that is, it, it's something to, to, to like keep. that because yeah. then you get like people that are like construing what he's talking about, especially with like pleasure principle, reality principle. And then he got like, I mean, I think even Eric Fromm is guilty of this, but then you got like Mar- Marcuse Bros talking about erot- uh, Eros and Thanatos uh, principles. It's like, that's not exactly what he was talking about, you know, and other Neo-Freudians, you know, they construe Freud as saying like the, Thana- the, the Thanatos principle and the Eros principles. No, they're not two separate. There was not a dualism in that sense. The dualism that there was any in uh Freud was something that Lacan points out in seminar one with the difference between libido drive and, and uh, ego drive, right? But he's pointing out that these drives are one and the same as far as like, if you would call it Eros and Thanatos thing, right? This pleasure or enjoyment, this jouissance of, of undermining oneself, right? And there is no need to ultimately like it it's useful to talk about these individual drives up until a point but if you don't ultimately subsume a multiplicity of drives under death drive then you're bound to fail or you're you're bound to um have to take recourse in a kind of Jungian notion of a sort of like a pantheon of yes a psychic investment but that you're right to say that it's like the, the the multiplicity of drives of, of libido is polymorphous perversity yeah yeah but ultimately it's all enfolded into death, into drive. death drive because yeah that's how it, like, it focuses itself and without yeah. that you have the desexualization of the libido which is no more than a domestication of right of of this and 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 trying to you know cr- basically put a happy ending onto what <laughs> not that kind, well if only not that kind <laughs> of happy, like a disney kind of ending yeah that onto what freud discovered which like let's be honest like jung is in many ways like the disney version of he really is yeah uh, whereas uh, like well then if that's the case then, freud's uh, a director's cut Freud, no, Freud's Pixar because he wants to make the mom thick. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
There's one thing we know about Freud. He loved his thick women. <laughs> <laughs> Got a elastic girl. <laughs> I didn't, I feel like, I guess we didn't spend all that much attention, like looking at the actual text of like the line items here. Um, because it's, it's, it's tough. I never know what to like home in on here, but yeah, you're, you're like, a careful enough reader that I just like, defer to your well i think right here is like it gets a, like i want to say like irrelevant or like like you just pay attention it's a little confusing but like they're working through the biology and like a little bit of like these like psychophysics type shit where he's talking about inertia constancy entropy and all these things to talk because he mentions a lot of these terms in beyond the pleasure principle because he wants to try to align sort of the notion of death drive to a scientific model using, like, I think the dude's name, the psychophysicist, uh, Fechner or Fechner, whatever his name is. Um, you read Beyond the Fetch Principle, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah. So, like, he's yeah. mentioning somebody like that and then, like, talking about entropy and, and inertia. And then overall trying to align drive with like uh, some, something like of an instinct, but it's not a biological instinct. It's, it's exactly the opposite. It just undermines Darwinism and it undermines any notion of an autonomous ego. But nonetheless, he wants to use these metaphors and science of like, well, inertia is going to be where there's no excitation, right? There's this, this constant stillness but then that would be death because only then there's no energy moving. So pleasure is like the um, the alleviation or the minimalization of excitation because excitation is overall the search for pleasure based upon that, but it always leads to some type of undermining because that excitation or the drive is the death drive and there's no pleasure in that. It's it, it, jouissance for Lacan. It's the enjoyment. And he's not bringing that up right here. But what, he, what they're doing is they're trying to tear apart these weird contradictions of looking at these weird biological examples to understand what is put into question, which is drive. I think that about does it. Yeah. I think we covered it. Mm -hmm. I think this was a banger of an episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you doubt us, if you doubt where we're taking this, then I'm afraid you're going to be left yeah. by the wayside because yeah. we are the subjects. Super <laughs> no. And no matter how much we try to hystericize the invisible interlocutor who is uh, our commenters uh, who, you know, we don't have many, but no one, no one's taken, no one's taken the bait, I guess until then, until someone challenges us, then I guess like we're just going to be riding roughshod over all y'all academics, everything y'all have to say when, you know, y'all get together <laughs> in your conferences in your symposia and you're too afraid to make a peep because you're all trying to impress each other, then we're, we're out here. We're outside. You can tell us where we're wrong. Yeah. Until then, you can, you can stay quiet. Death Drive Records right here. <laughs> mob Deep, we the motherfucking Mob Deep. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Like, if you don't <laughs> want a producer dancing in the video, <laughs> making a scene, come to Death Row. <laughs> that's it I gotta get ahead real quick I'll be back <laughs>